So I'm going to say very little because I can't, I can't say any more. Um, but just a few words of welcome and, and in particular to, to my close friends and colleagues from uh, University of Navarra and Pamplona, um, where some of the most interesting thinking is going on and most of the good eating is going on. Um, so in the name of the thinking and the eating, uh, I welcome my uh, colleagues from Pamplona. This is the second time that uh, this school and, and Pamplona have, have worked together on, on, on a theme. Uh, essentially, we, we, we do a congress here in New York where we explore with uh, some of the leading scholars of this school and, and um, the region on a very key question. And then the University of Pamplona does a much bigger event and a much bigger conference on the same thing or an even larger version of the same theme where they have solicited papers from young uh, writers from around the world. So a kind of the difference is then maybe a very uh, dense uh, single afternoon of consideration in New York is followed by one or two days of very lengthy uh, exploration by a, n a new generation. Uh, and it has been very productive and it, and it en ends up with a book. So you should see yourself as being in the beginning of a kind of book production process, which makes then perfect sense that your host for today uh, will be Craig Buckley, who's in charge of the kind of uh, publication experiments uh, at the school, but more than that is, is this semester teaching a class on manifestos um, and even his own uh, PhD research at Princeton is, 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 uh, gets very close to this issue in its concentration on, on the kind of radicalization of photo, photo collage uh, in our field. So I just want to hand, hand you over to, to Craig and wish you well. We have a lot of speakers, there's going to be a lot of thinking. Um, every now and then we're going to be rude and push things along, but most of the time we would rather listen to the ideas than to be obnoxious about time. Um, I think the question that we're raising today is a question that if you, if, you, if you say to almost anybody in our field, what happened to the architectural manifesto, their immediate reaction will be, yeah, what did happen? So there is a sort of a lingering sense that something's missing, but that doesn't mean that the manifesto went away. Uh, it's just that there's a lingering, uh, it's as if something's missing, but what exactly this thing is that's missing or what it is that we have desired or that we were being satisfied with before hasn't been clarified. So I think the purpose of today's event is try to understand what it is that we think was there such that we can then say what is not there. And, and of course, it's, it's very much in the nature of uh, desire that the things that you uh, miss and that you think that you've lost are the things that you never ever had. Uh, and I think there will be that dimension of uh, uh, today's argument. We may even discover that we're in, the, we're in the very age of the architectural manifesto and everything that you have thought of in the past as being an architectural manifesto is a somewhat weak, clumsy 20th century uh, uh, propaganda stunt. Anyway, that's the nature of the day. We don't really know which end of this question will fall apart. We hope that pretty much all of the question will fall apart and some deeper wisdom about what it is that manifestos could or should or should not do uh, will operate. Uh, Craig. Thank you, Mark, um, for the invitation to participate and also uh, for really putting the question on the table of today's event. Thanks also again to the, the University of Navarra for being such a great uh, partner in these ventures. Sorry. Mic, mic check? OK. Um, uh, so as you can see, if you have the program in front of you, today will be uh, a series of three panels. I'll give a brief introduction. And uh, we'll do very brief introductions before each panel of all the speakers. Uh, in addition to uh, that, I would just like to put in a plug. After the uh, event tonight, we're going to be launching the first uh, book in the series of these events, which came out of the last uh, conference that we did with the University of Pamplona. That'll be just outside here. Uh, please stick around to take a look and uh, to enjoy some refreshment. So I'll just jump in. Uh, I, think it, I think it goes without saying that uh, it's a particularly interesting moment to be thinking about manifestos. And therefore, we're especially lucky to have such a great group of thinkers come together to wrestle with the question of the manifesto. What happened to the architectural manifesto? It's the kind of question you usually ask when something has disappeared or when something has gone very wrong. 
It's a question that asks us to look both back at the manifesto's history, but also to examine the present, and indeed the future, through the lens of this particular genre. Manifestos seem to be enjoying a resurgence of late. Uh, what you're looking at here uh, was at the Serpentine Gallery's 2009 Manifesto Marathon, where the Frank Gehry Pavilion was a stage for a nonstop reading by architects and artists. Here in New York, um, <clears throat> here in New York, some of our most ambitious galleries are devoting events dedicated to generating and debating them. Of course, uh, the Storefront for Art and Architecture has been running a series for the last uh, year and a half, two years on manifestos. And of course, schools of architectures hold conferences about them. That said, there seems to be little consensus about the manifesto form itself. Some have embraced it with full-throated abandon. Others will argue that the genre has died. Still others approach it cautiously, protected by thick barriers of irony. The Occupy movements would seem to be one place to look for manifestos. And this is uh, an image from last night at the Brooklyn Bridge. And while there are some manifestos, the movement's commitment to leaderlessness has made it very wary of endorsing anything like a manifesto or a list of demands, using instead meme-like slogans and collective yet anonymous public actions to affect the larger discourse. Our present moment, then, seems neither thoroughly disgusted with the manifesto nor completely under its sway, but more potently unsure. By way of introduction, then, I would like to offer a few observations triggered by a class on manifestos I've been teaching this semester. I'll begin by noting very briefly some of the rhetorical features that literary theorists have identified in the genre in order to consider how this squares with the collecting of manifestos in our own field. I'd then like to point to one facet of the manifesto, namely how it's been a vehicle for making claims upon the discipline and to test this against a number of brief statements taken from manifestos themselves. And this is less uh, in the spirit of, say, providing a definition. I'm not sure that you could, in fact, do that. But rather, to look at manifestos as something of a shifting spectrum within our field's communicative apparatus, one whose borders are less a firm line than a shifting gradation. The manifesto has traditionally been identified with statements of conviction, urgency, and immediacy, a genre that seeks to push the domain of words as close as possible to the domain of deeds, harnessing reflection to immediacy and engagement. The force and persuasion of manifestos appears frequently in the form of injunctions, formulated with modal verbs, must, can, shall, will. The temperature of such injunctions modulates considerably, ranging from the imperative to the subjunctive, from the command and the demand to the more nuanced play between desired and hypothetical states of affairs. Manifestos, scholars also note, tend to be full of pronouns pointing to the place and time of utterance, as well as to the objects of concern. Here, now, today, this. Such deictic references point to moments, contexts, and bodies outside the text, and in doing so, they call upon them, grounding the text in immediacy. As significant as the pointers are the shifters, personal pronouns like I, we, you, and they, the play of such pronouns has a particularly important function in manifestos. The interpolation of we, which is far more common than I, remains a tricky type of plural expression. Even when it refers to a defined group, its exact referent can remain ambiguous, dependent on the context of enunciation and reception. We can allow an individual or a small group to appear to be many, a dynamic that carries the risk of speaking for others, but which also has the power to mobilize a powerful provisional, provisional constituency, a speaking position for an expansive virtual collectivity. Not surprisingly, the attempts within our field to gather together manifestos have likewise placed considerable emphasis on mechanisms of certainty and urgency. Ulrich Conrad's classic Programs and Manifestos of 20th Century Architecture, now almost 50 years old. This is the German version from 1964. Most of us are more familiar with the 1970 English translation. Uh, Conrad's version is, is almost 50 years old. It's confidently slim. It's matter of fact. It's prefaced by less than 300 words. Conrad's had no doubt what a manifesto was, nor which ones mattered. The collection was a direct response to the manifestos he heard around him in effect, a kind of meta-manifesto, against the, quote, crass subjectivity and anarchical caprice that appalled him in Friedrich Hundertwasser's 1958 Mold Manifesto Against Rationalism in Architecture, 
Conrad's assembled an impressive array of texts from pre-war avant-garde movements, summoned to exterminate such moldy caricatures of rationalist modernism. When Charles Jenks compiled, compiled his theories and manifestos of contemporary architecture in the mid-90s, he complained that Conrad's book had, quote, turned the architectural manifesto into a predictable event. Praising diversity, Jenks defines the manifesto as a particular combination of the volcano and the tablet, a pouring forth of awe-inspiring emotion combined with an Old Testament-like propensity for handing down laws. Manifestos, he argues, are the work of, quote, jealous prophets calling the class to order by damning other teachers. From prophets to teachers, it's only one step to religions and schools, which, which Jenks quickly identifies in one of his by now familiar categorization games, passing from postmodern to postmodern ecological, late modern, neo modern, traditional, and so on. Yet, despite the will to clarity and categorical thinking, uncertainties lurk on nearly every page. Jenks never draws a line between a theory and a manifesto an ambiguity compounded by the fact that the majority of the book is the product of Jenks' own highly selective editing, which creates statements of manifesto-like brevity by extracting and recombining passages cut from articles, catalogs, and books. So, so paradoxically then, while we look to manifestos for statements of clarity, they themselves are often highly uncertain documents. Is it really clear what constitutes a manifesto? Even a cursory sketch of the terms evolution shows that it has de designated quite different things at different moments in history. Uh, and I'll go this very, very briefly because I think Tony will give a history today. In the 16th and 17th centuries, following the invention of movable type, a manifesto was a printed declaration by a sovereign justifying decisions about war and other matters of state. From the outset then, the manifesto makes an appeal to a public, even if it does not initially invite debate. It is only with the formation of the bourgeois public sphere in the 18th and 19th centuries that the manifesto emerges, in the sense that we are familiar with, as a genre of public political address. And yet, even as manifestos appeal to such publics, they remain in tension with them, often deliberately exceeding the norms of rational deliberation and consensus in calling for immediate and revolutionary action. The genre passes from the political domain to that of aesthetics quite late, in fact, only towards the end of the 19th century, with Jean Moraes's Symbolist Manifesto, published in Le Figaro in 1886, widely cited as the first literary manifesto. But even here, at the supposed origin of the aesthetic manifesto, we find ambiguity. Moraes did not write a manifesto. It is remembered as one because Le Figaro's editor, Auguste Marcade, printed it printed at Moraes's article with the title, A Literary Manifesto. The avant-garde quickly learned Marcad's lesson and adopted the manifesto as the preferred tool for forming movements. In this context, it's worth recalling that perhaps the most canonical manifesto of early 20th century architecture, Santalia and Marinetti's 1914 Manifesto of Futurist Architecture, holds similar uncertainties. First published by Santalia as a brief massaggio to the reader of an exhibition catalog, it became the manifesto when Marinetti, himself an adept student of Marcade, republished it under that name, taking the liberty of expanding and re-editing Santelia's text with an entire roster of his own editions. All of which means that the manifesto can't be restricted to those statements intended by the author as manifestos. In fact, they frequently become manifestos by virtue of how they are published, disseminated, and received. If anything, it is this continual tension between writing and the agents, technologies, and media used to disseminate it that frequently make the manifesto. And one thing we can think about today is how this tension between writing and its changing apparatus of dissemination contributes to the genre's protein capacity for rebirth and transformation. The manifesto's continual disappearing and reappearing act takes place in the most ephemeral forms, in speeches and declarations, in newspapers, posters, in leaflets and magazines, and now via an even more changeable and horizontal array of blogs, tweets, and tumblers. While the manifesto may have familiar, even predictable elements, it lacks a definite profile, shifting cannily as it picks up new disguises from epoch to epoch. Even more strangely, we are, continued to, we are continually tempted to treat these ephemeral statements as if they were stable landmarks, points from which, to, from which the swirl of historical development, the contours of movements, even the shifting of paradigms could be mapped. And I'll risk pushing that one step further. You could say that manifestos are not only uncertain as documents, 
but they flourish and intensify precisely in moments of uncertainty, during the collapse of the Habsburg Empire, in the revolutionary years just after World War I, in the Great Depression, during the Algerian War, the Vietnam War, the oil and economic crises of the 1970s, and of course the list could go on. To read the manifesto only as a declaration of polemical confidence in law-like certainty, then, would be to miss its value as a detector of uncertainty, to not see how it insistently points us at those moments of doubt and objects of concern that have provoked it. The question I'll put on the table is about the types of claims architects have used the manifesto to make and whether these can only be made via the manifesto. Manifestos have been a key mechanism by which architects uh, articulate claims upon the discipline, but also upon society more broadly. I'll touch on three types of claims, pointing to particular passages where these dynamics appear. The first pertain to claims made upon history. The second to claims made upon norms within the field. And the third are claims to collective forms of identity. And I deliberately chose statements that were not only ideologically diverse, but that, with the exception of one, appear neither in Conrad's or Jenks, just to reinforce the point that a great deal of this material is, in fact, uh, uncollected. For a genre so preoccupied with the present, it's interesting to note how frequently manifestos operate by polemically remaking history. Whether in the space of a paragraph, sometimes even in a single sentence, Manifestos provoke by means of condensed, biased, and often extreme forms of historical revision. Santalia's Manifesto of Futurist Architecture begins with this memorable line added to it by Marinetti. While few post-war manifestos tempt such bombast, they contain an entire spectrum of interesting claims upon history. Asger Jorn's 1954 exchange with Max Bill over the newly founded Hochschule für Gestaltung at Ulm stakes its claim upon a artistic revolution confronting the dead language of cubism and constructivism, which he believed were being used to found a new academicism. Likewise, the lines from Archigram's first editorial in 1961 vowed to, quote, bypass the decaying Bauhaus image. In both cases, the claim is that to remain true to such revolutionary legacies, one must turn against their contemporary incarnations. They bet everything on the unknown, while simultaneously and subtly laying claims to ancestors. In 1960, the Dutch architect Constant makes a different type of claim, not on the avant-garde, but rather on the city. Urban history appears as a type of broken promise, full of plans for social integration that have degenerated into mechanisms of alienation. Yet the manifesto does not mourn that past. Rather, it embraces the forces of decomposition and even exacerbates them as the necessary condition for a more radical transformation. Kisho Kurokawa's 1969 capsule declaration, by contrast, takes a different path. It is not the history of architecture or the city he appeals to, but rather to a radical technological shift from a world of tools to a condition in which technology is more thoroughly merged with the tissue of human existence. The manifesto takes a claim upon the meaning not only of an epochal shift in technology, <coughs> but upon an inability to clearly locate where the human ends and the machines begin. And of course, oops, sorry. And of course, there's Rem Koolhaas's Delirious New York, a decade later. Here the architect polemically seizes the very act of writing history itself, turning the historian's object into a retroactive manifesto, culminating in the architect's own theoretical position. The second type of claim concerns established norms and frequently operates by introducing doubt into the relationship between what is understood to be central and what is marginal. Consider, for instance, the brief statement issued in January 1954 by a group of young architects tasked with drafting a working document for CIM 10. Their challenge proceeded by formulating a concept for something excluded from the logic of the Athens Charter. The concept of human association proposed community as part of a total complex of, indivis of indivisible relationships that resisted the charter's functionalist categories. Reconceptualizing an excluded term as central appears here less as an, an attempt to undermine power than to take it over, to claim an institution central to the field. A quite different claim upon marginality appears in Hans Holein's 1968 aphoristic observation about TV sets in Alice's Architecture. The prospect of a still emergent mass medium is placed on par with the sites reserved for a culture's highest ambitions. The question of cultural hierarchy is aligned with a, conse with a consequent shift in architectural attitudes from a strict concentration on buildings to a serious appraisal of the architectural implications of diverse types of media. 
1971, the London group Street Farmers Farms Manifesto sought to introduce farming, uncontrolled plantings, and ecological experimentation into the center of the city. Such homegrown practices aimed to unmake the urban-rural dichotomy in a bid to subvert that which appeared most implacable, the state's control over the urban environment. And of course, in the late 70s, there's Bernard Schumi's appropriation of the manifesto as a platform for a series of conceptual projects. Here, the manifesto goes beyond the marginal to stake a claim upon the domain of transgression in a bid to reveal, and thus open to question, the rules governing the field's ever-changing moral economy. The final claim pertains to the formation of shared identities. Taken as a type of speech act, the manifesto is an utterance that outlines a provisional identity that does not yet exist, but which it seeks to bring into existence. And here we see how the manifesto links up with the prevalence of architectural groups during the 60s and 70s. Noboru Kawazoe's introduction to the 1960 Metabolist Manifesto provides a very conscious example, as the name both identifies a shared concern for biological processes and simultaneously describes a group identity that grows and contracts with its own metabolic rate. The 1971 invitation to participate in S-Space, a short-lived project by the groups Superstudio and 9999, can be read as a manifesto, enjoining an ambiguous student or environmental cultivator to join a we, devoted to examining the 99.99% of the environment escaping normal awareness. S-Space was itself an indeterminate entity, a group assembling in different places in Florence, places that were, quote, formed, composed, and realized in the gamut of information channels used for their dissemination. The dissemination of the manifesto, the collective identity, and its gathering place in a gamut of channels indeed foreshadows the strange togetherness and separation of virtual identities today. Yet it's important to note that such seemingly immaterial information channels were crucial not just to virtual identities, however, but to physical occupations, such as the occupation of the French Order of Architects during, the May, during May of 1968. The open letter issued by the occupiers was similarly designed to identify the occupation in the magazines, leaflets, newspapers, and radio programs through which it was disseminated. The we of the manifesto affirms the identity of the occupiers as a collective subject announcing the meaning of this temporary identity as a fundamental questioning of the legitimacy of an opposed identity, the order as a body managing the architectural profession. The we in the declaration defines a movement from a past to a present to a future collective subject, evoked in still another identity, the autonomous self-managed university which they sought to invent. In each case, whether about history, about hierarchy, or about identity, uncertainty does not prevent the making of a claim, but in fact fuels it, serving as the fulcrum by which the manifesto declares a rupture in time, arguing for a shift in the direction of history and proposing a particular future. We might ask whether the manifesto continues to play the role of, of enacting claims, and if so, which ones, or whether this mechanism and its role have shifted. And this sketch, of course, is, is just one reading of the manifesto. I look forward, as I'm sure all of you are, to hearing about many others this afternoon. And with that, I'll briefly introduce uh, the speakers of the first uh, panel uh, and then pass the podium to them. First will be uh, Anthony Vidler, who is Dean and uh, Professor at the Irwin S. Chainin School of Architecture, the Cooper Union. He is the author, of course, of, of many books. Uh, I will only point out a few of the most recent ones. Modern Culture, uh, sorry, uh, Histories of the, of the Immediate President, of the immediate present, inventing architectural modernism, scenes of the street, and forthcoming in the spring, uh, which we all look forward to, the U Utopia tapes from uh, the AA School of Architecture. Following Anthony will be uh, Enrique Walker, uh, who is the director of the program in advanced architectural design here at Columbia University. He's the author of Chew Me on Architecture, Conversations with Enrique Walker. Uh, last on the panel will be Felicity Scott, uh, she's an assistant professor and, of architecture and the director of the program in critical curatorial and conceptual practices here at GSAP. She's an editor of the magazine Grey Room and author of Ant Farm, Allegorical Time Warp, and Architecture or Techno-Utopia, Politics After Modernism. So with that, uh, I'll welcome Anthony Vidler to the podium. Thank you.
we have that? Oh. So thank you, Craig, um, preparing for this and thinking about this uh, afternoon made me both uh, terribly nostalgic and slightly optimistic. Um, because I, I, I thought, as Craig already demonstrated, that almost everything that architects wrote in the last uh, 150 years could be called a manifesto in one way or another, I thought I would declare the autonomy, the singularity, and uh, individuality of the genre for purposes of argument this afternoon. So where did it come from in its own word? Well, we have to understand that manifest comes from the old French manifest and the Latin manifestus, which means st struck by the hand, palpable, evident, making clear, from manus and infestus, infestare, means to attack, to trouble in a hostile manner, to be bold, to overrun in large numbers, to be harmful or bothersome, to swarm over, to be parasitic in or host to. But of course the Latin festum also means feast and celebration, which means at the same time as manifestos make trouble, they also celebrate the fact. It's well established that the first modern manifesto, indeed the first of its kind, to form in its most complete form the modern genre of the manifesto was the Communist Manifesto written by Marx and Engels collectively in 1847 and published in 1848. The genre they invented was brilliantly concocted from a wide range of previous genres and eloquently rolled into a single form that continued to operate not only in politics but also in poetics for more than a century. It's a form that despite attempts to revive it from time to time has, for all intents and purposes, this is a, a proposition for argument this afternoon, fallen into disuse, or rather, has seemed to outlive its use. Now, this is a contentious statement, especially for those art and architecture, poetic and literary movements that have couched their post-World War II statements of principle in the forms of manifestos. But it will, I hope, become clear that I define use not in terms of any intention by the writers, that of the writer, but of the context, that of the audience. And I do think that from the high times of manifesto writing, i.e. from 1848 through 1945, there has been a significant shift in the form of cultural revolution and a corresponding shift in the receptivity to the manifesto and the use of a manifesto as a defining genre of the trade. Let me return for a moment to the genre itself as it was cooked up by Marx and Engels. Where did this astoundingly influential model come from? How did this text that Martin Pushner in his brilliant study, Poetry of the Revolution, Marx Manifestos and the Avant-Garde, count it as influencing, quote, the course of history more directly and lastingly than almost any other text? How did this text come into being, so to speak, seemingly out of whole cloth and ready to be adopted as it was from 1909 on as a genre equally effective in cultural realms as in political. The answer to the question, Pushner writes, must be sought not so much in the history of revolutions, but in the manifesto itself, and must be sought not only in its content, but also in its form. And uh, Craig has referred to the poetics of its form in a particular way. As a form, it was a strange hybrid. Traditionally, a manifest, as Craig mentioned, was not at all revolutionary, but a dictate the declaration of a will of a sovereign or a state or its military. But it was also connected to a potentially more subversive act, the religious act of revelation or manifestation, the tradition of the apocalyptic revelations of St. John the Divine, and this link to the apocalypse was folded into the Marxian genre too. Thus a call to action, military or otherwise, and a revelation, religious or otherwise. Adopted by Luther for the Reformation, the 95 Theses, and against him by Thomas Munster for the Swabian Peasant Revolt, adopted by the Diggers and Gerard Wynne Stansley in their radical revolt against the Puritan Revolution in England, the tracks of the more violent revolution was couched in apocalyptic formulations. Indeed, the radical Pur Pur Puritans, the levelers, were the first to call their statement a manifesto in 1648, precisely 200 years uh, before Marx and in Marx's absolute self-consciousness but inscribed in the history of radical revolutions traced by Marx himself. Add to this the fundamental declarations of the rights of man and citizen of the French Revolution out of the Enlightenment, the Declaration of Independence and its constitutional outcome, and the amalgam is ready to be made. 
but with one significant change. The manifestos previous to Marx were all based in a sense of historical continuity, of reform or revolution. For Marx and Engels, however, as described in their correspondence as they were writing the, the manifesto, the aim was to rewrite history. Craig has already mentioned that tendency. To reframe it entirely so as to conceive it as a continuous process of revolution towards a new and imminent revolution. History as revolution, as Marshall Berman has noted. The Communist Manifesto was something more, however. It was a special kind of what Austin would call a speech act, the transformation of words into actions. As Pushna has it, Marx and Engels achieved the performative content of their manifesto by combining a sense of total authority drawn from history, a challenge to the present to recognize this history, with brilliantly performative theatrical speak acts, street speech acts, and a clear position from which they, as authors channeling their history, spoke. All these attributes will, as we will see, be taken over by the cultural avant-garde of the 20th century. Thus, in the Communist Manifesto, we see the haunting of the specter of communism, a reference to the ghost of Hamlet's father, or to the famous phrase, all that is solid melts into air, echoing the last lines of the tempest. It is, of course, an irony of the history of the Communist Manifesto that both those phrases come from the literary traditions of the second translator of the Manifesto into English, Mr. Moore. In German, however, with much less effect, the literal translations of these phrases, the phrase, the specter of communism, should be translated, a frightful hobgoblin stalks through Europe. <laughs> and all that is solid melts into air, literally in the German, everything feudal and fixed evaporates. So one of the most important parts of the Communist Manifesto that's been translated as a theatrical speech act and given in English the, uh, the power of, uh, of Marx and Engels' rhetoric was actually from the English translator. Sometimes mistranslation works. The position from which the speaker, and it's important that manifesto have an oral theatrical ring to it, the backing of history or its entire revision, the deep structure of a quasi-religious credo, the anticipation of apocalypse in the present, and the assumption of the possibility of not the immediate inevitability of a revolution all make this genre ready for the picking. And we remember it was so picked. What do we do here? Is this, do we wave our hands? Do we? Oh, it, oh, it's here? Yeah. Okay. And it was so picked by Marinetti and his friends in Milan as propounded in the founding manifesto of futurism in 1609 on the front page, no less, of the daily paper Figaro. Not even Marx could get that front page spread. The location, we have been up all night, my friends and I, the history in the claustrophobic surroundings of their parents' over-decorated and decadent apartment, the revolutionary gesture racing from the past into the future in their new automobiles, the ap apocalyptic revelation, or rather neo-baptism, immersion in and emerging out of the canal-side mud as if newborn and primitive, sucking on the teats, as he says, of his Sudanese nurse, a primitive rebirth indeed, and then the credo, we believe, we call, we deny, we demand. The rest is, so to speak, history. The history of a genre reformulated, readopted for new purposes, reinterpreted and rewritten, but an effective genre for almost every avant-garde movement in the period 1909 to 1968. But what about the architectural manifesto? Was this a specific genre of its own, following the political and cultural manifestations, manifestos of Marx and Marinetti? Here, the architectural manifestos and their cognates, following Marinetti, were presented to do away with the discipline of treatise, the preferred form of architectural discourse since the rediscovery of Vitruvius in the Renaissance, the last of which, written by Gaudet, was published at the very end of the 19th century. Here, Marx and Marinetti had had their effect. History was suspended. As Marx had noted in his essay on the failure of the 1848 revolution in the uh, Brumaire of uh, Louis Napoleon, quote, the social revolution of the 19th century cannot derive its poetry from the past, but only from the future. It cannot begin with itself. It has to shed all superstition, su superstitious belief in the past. The revolution must be, let the dead bury the dead in order to arrive at its own content. There, the phrase exceeded the content, that's in the past. Here, the content exceeds the phrase. The architects of the early 20th century were of the same mind. 
abstraction and the suspension of history went hand in hand to erase all traces, or so it was hoped, of the academic system of classicism and the styles. Architectural manifestos proper were surprisingly, however, not as prolific as in the other arts. Uh, let me just, um, that's a, a little bit of Marinetti. Is it? Ah, a little bit of Marinetti. And that's where, of course, individual images can always take on a manifesto semblance. And of course, Russia and Dada. Architectural manifestos proper were surprisingly, however, not as prolific as in the other arts. Antonio Santelia was induced by Marinetti to compose or be composed by with a manifesto of futurist architecture in 1914. The De Stael group published five explicit manifestos. Oscar Slemmer published a manifesto for the first Bauhaus exhibition in 1923. The Russians, under the influence of and contesting the dictates of futurism, published quite a few, among them Malevich's Supremacist Manifesto of 1924. Now, this is where I actually think it's absolutely important if a writer or writers call their little tract a manifesto or not. And I think it's really very interesting that after the example of the Communist Manifesto, you could not call your work a manifesto unless you really intended it to be a manifesto of this kind. On the whole, architects, and this is also from the evidence of Ulrich Conrads, tended to prefer theses, principles, tenets, definitions, or projects, rather than outright manifestos. Indeed, the test came with Le Corbusier, who openly stated his dislike of, dislike of futurism in the preface to Vers en Architecture, and who certainly had had the intention of writing the next great treatise, but who nevertheless not to be outdone by the futurists, interspersed his didactic chapters on working principles for architectural form and function with what one might call residual or analogical manifesto statements at the head of each chapter. So there was a kind of interspersion of the didactic uh, um, uh, proposal of a manifesto in the actual treatise, which was much more academic in that sense. Thus the title of the first anthology of such statements uh, notwithstanding also Le Corbusier is uh, quite willing to use the uh, sub sub subterranean religious uh, demands of the Manifesto Credo. This is the English version published in uh, 1970 and actually uh, translated by Nicholas Bullock who had been drawn to it because uh, he was a co-editor with Nicholas Stedman, uh, Stephen Bann um, in Cambridge of the, uh, of the Little Avant-Garde magazine form published in the 1960s. So the title of the first anthology of such statements, Programs and Manifestos of 20th Century Architecture, was apt enough. Conrad's published some 60 programs and manifestos, from Henry van, Henri van der Velde's program of 1903 to Jona Friedman's 1962 Ten Principles of Space Town Planning. But the difference between a program and a manifesto became specific and the reluctance of architects to join with their artist friends was, was patent and an intimation of what was to come in the 60s and 70s, 70s when the manifesto became almost extinct, at least in architecture. But before coming extinct, the manifesto had to be historicized. For Conrad's book was the direct heir and result of Rainer Banham's research in the late 50s into the origins and history of the modern movement. It was Banham, after all, who had publicized in AR the Futurist Manifesto in the mid-1950s, as well as that of Santelia, and his history was in effect a way of relegating manifesto culture to its academic historical home, while at the same time trying to associate himself with it, hence the new brutalism of 55 and taking stock in 1960. We'll return to this belated manifesto culture in a moment. And it was thus in Conrad's that we read in school in tandem with Bannum's theories and design of three years earlier. But if we take a glance at the contents of the next few anthologies of architectural theory statements, this becomes clear. Joan Ockman's unsurpassed collection of 1993 abandons such word, the word manifesto and programs altogether in favor of architecture culture. And it consisted almost entirely of longer statements or excerpts from articles or chapters. 
Out of over 70 selections, only one retained the title of manifesto, and that one might be counted as the last of the modern genre, the Team 10 manifesto, the Dawn manifesto, actually was, they titled it the Dawn manifesto of 1951, Van Eyck, Van Ginkel, Bachemer, Hoves, Grove, Smithson, Volker. Later compilations were even more discursive. Kate Nesbitt's one was called Theorizing a New Agenda for Architecture, published in 1996 and subtitled An Anthology of Architectural Theory. So now we're into theory completely and not into manifestos at all, with long selections from even longer books. Michael Hayes' follow-up collection to Ackman, Architecture Theory Since 68, published in 2000, was equally if not more discursive, taking whole long articles and chapters for books Interpretation, historical examination, analysis, quasi-philosophical exploration gives the tenor. Revolutionary stridency has given place to worry about the right way to do architecture, a worry not seen since the late 19th century. Indeed, a worry that produced not a few attempts to write new treatises for the discipline, a discipline that threatened by science, technology, economics, and society has resorted since the 1960s to a search for quasi-autonomy and new guiding principles that would authorize its role in the new heterogeneous world. Unlike previous treatises, however, from Vitruvius on, these new ones revealed a deep sense of in insecurity and inferiority to adjoining disciplines, to science, of course, but also to psychology, and above all, to philosophy. The case for a theory of modern architecture, uh, uh, assayed by uh, Summerson in, uh, in, uh, in 1957, uh, begins to, to survey all the possible ways in which a modern architecture could find solace in authority in science, and he actually concludes biology. Peter Eisenman's claims for autonomy were, of course, heavily reliant on the formal principles of Gestalt psychology. Norbert Schultz Intentions in architecture were derived, despite an apparent neutrality of approach, from his heavy misreading of Heidegger as defining a phenomenological comfort zone, rather than the abyssal implications of the author of being in time. Venturi's complexity and contradiction was more a reflection on the forms of interpretation and compositional strategies, despite Scully's claim that it was the most powerful call to arms since Le Corbusier's Vers in architecture. My use of the word discursive in these remarks is not innocent, however. For I'd simply note that it was symptomatic of this shift from the manifesto to the rumination that Michel Foucault's inaugural lecture at the Collège de France in 1971 was entitled L'Ordre du Discourse, The Order of Discourse, and that it took the form of a lengthy elaboration of how to conduct discourse analysis as a way of unpacking the analysis-resistant discourses of the hegemonic disciplines and ideologies. As interpreted by social and even architectural historians and theorists, this was an open invitation to first identify and then unpack the discourse of architecture, which was now revealed as not only hegemonic over design ideology, but deeply ramified within a spreading network of relations with other discursive formations from law to religion to medicine and the like. The brilliance of Survey Punia in selecting Bentham and the Panopticon as a trope for the installation of social order for the bourgeois throughout the 19th and 20th centuries was not in his picking on architecture as a tool for such order, but in revealing the complex complicity of architecture in that order, a complicity to be historicized and theorized by Tafuri after 1968. Thus, by a strange twist of fate, architectural thought and critical architectural thought especially, seen in the 1970s and 80s as architectural theory, was itself against architecture, or at least against the very disciplines that the new treatises tried to reinstate and support. And I would say that that, that is not exactly the same as manifesto culture. Architecture against itself was at once meta-historical and meta-disciplinary, and thus left very little in the way of principles, rules of composition, or, or the like for students in these years. If there were any manifesto statements from De Boer to Hunterwasser to Fuller to Akizum or Superstudio, they were statements against architecture, dystopian or techno-futurist, or as in the case of the handout of Ant Farm or the innumerable claims for architecture without architects, simple returns to a supposed pre-lapsarian state of pre-industry or vernacular self-build. Today, we, and we will discuss today, all these heterogeneous texts and more. And despite Charles Jenks' brave attempts to call his own anthology of the 2006 
theories and manifestos in contemporary architecture, only one single manifesto can be found among his 144 experts, excerpts. And that brave one is by Lebius Woods, in the true spirit of Marxism and Futurism. I end with its echoing tones that nevertheless reverberate back through the 20th and 19th century to 1909 and even more to 1847. Lebius writes, this is 1993, architecture and war are not incompatible. Architecture is war, war is architecture. I am at war with my time, with history, with all the authority that resides in a fixed and frightening forms. I am one of millions who do not fit in, who have no home, no family, no doctrine, no firm place to call my own, no known beginning or end, no sacred and primordial site. I declare war on all idiots, idiocies and finalities on all histories that would chain me within my own falselessness to my own pitiful fields. I only know moments and lifetimes that are moments and forms that appear with infinite strength and then melt into air, obvious reference. I am an architect, a constructor of words, a sensualist who worships the flesh, the melody, a silhouette against the darkening sky, and I, can, I cannot know your name, nor can you know mine. Tomorrow we begin together the construction of a city. Levius is cri de coeur might be dismissed now as a romantic nostalgia from the time when such fighting words had real social and architectural resonance. But I infinitely prefer this challenge to my mind and senses, and challenge it is, than to read the 1,000 pages of a treatise that purports to be nothing more than exhaustive proof that parametric design was invented by Alberti, brought to its perfection by parametric digital design today, and is the answer to the building of the non-critical neoliberal capitalist city. And I think it is very, very pertinent that the author of this long treatise, which purports to subsume all treatises under the name of the parametric, has initials called PS. Thank you. So the title of my presentation is Retroactive Manifestos. Um, and I must say, this is uh, also the, the first entry and the entry that gave uh, uh, birth to a project I started five years ago called the Dictionary of Received Ideas, a project uh, that um, has as a goal to um, examine and archive received ideas in architectural culture of the past uh, 10 years. Um, in other words, strategies or concepts that have been used recurrently to the point of, be, of depleting their original uh, vigor, or as I would actually uh, say it, um, strategies that have outlived the problems they originally uh, addressed. And it's of course a product indebted to uh, Flaubert, uh, Home Dictionary of Received Ideas. So, um, in 1999, uh, Rem Kohlhaas and Hans-Ulrich Hobrist uh, interviewed uh, Robert Venturi and Dennis Good Brown in Geneva. The, um, that interview appeared uh, two years later in uh, the second volume of uh, the Harvard Project on the City uh, called uh, The Harvard Guide to Shopping um, under the title Relearning from uh, Las Vegas. The, the interesting point about uh, this uh, interview is that basically, as uh, Rem Cole has uh, articulated the first question, uh, there's a prefatory remark where basically Cole has um, establishes that uh, learning from Las Vegas was um, the last manifesto and the first in a series of books on cities that imply a manifesto. And I will say it again just because it's actually the core of the argument. Um, learning from Las Vegas is the last manifesto and the first in a series of books uh, on cities that imply uh, a manifesto. And Rem has basically adds uh, four to that list. Uh, one on New York, one on LA, one on Singapore, and one on Lagos. Uh, interesting enough, at the same moment that uh, Cole has identified a genealogy, um, he places his own uh, work within that genealogy instantly. As a matter of fact, uh, the book on New York, we uh, speculate uh, that it's Deleuze New York. The book on LA is probably Rainer Banham's uh, The Architecture of Four Ecologies. Um, the text on Singapore is probably the long essay he publishes as part of Small, Medium, Large, Extra Large. And the book on Lagos, he 
admits at the time is basically um, the third installment of the Harvard project on the city. As a matter of fact, three of the four books that uh, Cole has uh, uh, states in the list are his own. So um, um, in so doing, basically, he uh, identifies the lineage. Uh, the moment he identifies the lineage, he uh, introduces the work within it, and at the same time, uh, also, um, as we will see, um, uh, kills the, the lineage as well. So um, what was some of the, let's say, the critiques that were implicit with the manifesto that, uh, um, that basically imply this uh, turning point in the genre? One, and this actually uh, quoted by many at the time from the 60s to the 70s, was that basically none of the manifestos uh, had actually uh, materialized in the form of a, uh, none of them had basically had any of the results they had uh, announced or predicted. But then there were a number of pitfalls that had to do with the specific way in which a, a text works in relation to a building in the practice of architecture. As a, as a matter of fact, most of the people working with manifestos were actually architects, uh, practicing architects. Um, so it was basically about the deployment of arguments, but also the ways in which those arguments would basically enter the realm of uh, design. So two of those pitfalls were that basically um, a manifesto somehow condemned the, the, the architectural project to simply illustrate um, uh, the manifesto. As a matter of fact, the, the manifesto was elaborated independently um, and uh, pre previously independently from the specific conditions uh, that a product implied. Um, in addition to that, basically, text and product would basically um, depend on one another for uh, legitimacy. As a matter of fact, a manifesto had to be illustrated uh, in a building, and a building had to basically be preceded by a manifesto. So it's actually not a coincidence that both Brem Colhas and Robert Venturi had already playfully worked with the term uh, manifesto. Um, in uh, complexing contradiction in architecture, Venturi speaks about a gentle manifesto, which is a contradiction. Uh, manifesto is never gentle. Um, and uh, in 1978, uh, in Deleuze, New York, Rem Kohlhaas speaks about a retracted manifesto, which is also a contradiction. A manifesto is never basically preceded by evidence, but basically has to be, uh, the argument precedes indeed uh, the evidence. Um, so these were actually immediate uh, um, forms of problematizing the legacy of the genre. It is also not a coincidence that both Venturi and Cole has, uh, had, uh, had basically theorized and even elevated the figure of the brief within the architectural project and the role it had uh, within the making of architecture. On the one hand, Robert Venturi in Complex and Contradiction, in architecture basically the main argument is that uh, a brief is by definition uh, complex, therefore a product by definition will be contradictory. So any kind of a wish of optimization, which is actually part of a uh, uh, the, um, the argument contained in the 1,000 pages uh, treatise is, uh, is simply uh, an illusion. Architectural design is by definition negotiation of problems that have no synthesis. So that's one. On the second hand, uh, on the other hand, you have basically Rem Kool has also discussing uh, the brief. Uh, not only the brief uh, or the client is the, the main argument for underlying small, medium, large, extra large, the way in which the book is actually organized upon scales because any uh, form of, uh, of consistent delivery of argument uh, is, um, is at odds with the making of architecture. But before that, he had already discussed the notion of the surfer on the wave, that the architect uh, can simply basically choose which wave uh, to, uh, to surf, and uh, of course, that uh, even if it's uh, skillfully uh, um, surfed, um, the, um, the surfing would never redefine the nature of the sea. Um, as a matter of fact, basically both architects are discussing the invention of arguments in architecture from the very problem a product uh, addresses. So um, the, the retracted manifesto as a formulation um, starts by the premise that basically um, the, um, that the evidence proceeds uh, and uh, and leads to an argument. As a bulk of evidence would inevitably lead uh, to an argument, rather than the like, historical form where an argument preceded and was illustrated uh, uh, on evidence. Um, so um, the, the main point is that the city is therefore uh, seen as a repository of, uh, of architectural inventions. And in this respect, uh, we can even say that the, 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 the format has a, a present in, in Rossi. Basically, the city has to be scrutinized, because the city contains not only uh, uh, not only the positive of a manifest on the city, but also potential uh, inventions, tool, artifacts, types that architecture can actually uh, uh, appropriate to nourish its own uh, position. And that basically implies also an adjustment that the findings in a city are always already kind of a, uh, a definitive tool for the making of architecture. So in addition to that, it's not any city that, uh, that hosts a retroactive manifesto. The city which is chosen 
is a city which is, uh, on the one hand, basically is not preceded by a theory. It just happened without the knowledge of the field of architecture or the field of urbanism, um, and whose built evidence is massive um, and could potentially amount to, uh, to a manifesto. And um, in addition to that, basically, the, the city is, uh, has not been addressed by the field of architecture. Uh, the field of architecture has been reluctant to address it, has basically been slightly, uh, has abhorred uh, the city. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't uh, acknowledge the city until there's enough built evidence for uh, the inevitability of having to acknowledge the city as a possibility. As a matter of fact, architecture uh, excludes this architecture from the field. Um, but um, indeed, it arrives uh, always uh, late. The, the phenomenon is there. And at some point, basically, architecture has to face it and polemically and uh, opportunistically basically adopt it within the field. So the evidence is uh, of a particular kind. It is basically uh, the architecture which architecture excludes from architecture. Um, indeed, it's stuff which is built, but that the field doesn't accept within it. Uh, from the sprawl city to the generic city, from the strip to the elevator, from the gas station to air conditioning, from the billboard to the escalator. As a matter of fact, basically a number of stuff with the, which the field had rejected uh, or basically banished outside the borders of the field for a while until at some point the field has to acknowledge it. So basically the retroactive manifesto not only implies that the evidence uh, um, precedes the argument, but also that the evidence is an evidence that the field was an, uh, reluctant to uh, problematize or absorb within the field. It basically speaks about our puritanical uh, concerns as, uh, as field. So um, in that respect, basically, I would, I would say that the city, which is chosen for the retroactive manifesto, is considered as a fee market uh, for a surrealist. And it's basically a place uh, full of stuff where basically one could wander around, and indeed, traveling is a strategy of defamiliarization, where basically one could opportunistically find a piece that basically nourishes uh, an argument. And that basically links the retroactive manifesto to a tradition in uh, Dada and surrealism onto uh, situationism of basically wandering and drifting, but also before the Venturis in, uh, in, uh, in the generation of Team 10, the, the extraordinary effect that uh, some surrealist and Dada staff had on people like Aldo van Eyck, who basically traveled through Dogonland, influenced by a, uh, the second issue of the, of the surrealist magazine Minotaur, which was guest edited by uh, Michel Laris. Uh, and in addition to that, Alison and Peter Smithson basically traveling uh, through uh, the Bethnal Green, the East End in London, through the images of Nigel Henderson, uh, with indeed uh, the extraordinarily uh, Dada, uh, um, the, uh, basically uh, the, the influence of the independent group, which was heavily uh, influenced by Dada and, and surrealism. Um, so, um, so basically, what is it about learning from Las Vegas? As, uh, how can we see it as a, as a, as a turning point? It has been, indeed, as uh, Cole has uh, claims, both a manifesto as well as a uh, book on a city that implies a manifesto. How does it work as a manifesto? I would say that basically, as a manifesto, it indeed operates with uh, the traditional format of the declaration of a crisis and the declaration of a way out, which is almost inevitable. Uh, and that basically happens through uh, the following arguments, uh, I would dare say. Um, there's a critique of a generation of architects uh, in the book, a generation of architects that had been trained uh, in the modern movement, and therefore had been trained to uh, produce forms by strictly following uh, functions. Um, but that has also been trained not to use ornament, because ornament was considered a crime. In other words, basically two key maxims to the modern movement. The argument in the Venturi is actually quite uh, extraordinary, because the, the claim is that the two maxims could not work together. As a matter of fact, since ornament is not allowed, uh, and form is to be produced upon function, what happens is basically that generation of architects starts distorting the function in order to produce expressive form. As a result of which, the Venturis claim, what these architects produce is basically buildings that are huge ornaments. In other words, the, pro the prohibition of ornament and the fact that you designed form upon function implied that some architects started basically distorting the components of function and structure in order to achieve expressive uh, form, and uh, therefore basically being uh, not modern at all. So, um, this uh, typology, the Venturi's claim, is a duck. Uh, that's actually the, te the term they, they define in architecture that distorts its uh, function for expressive uh, purposes. Um, and the, the antidote, the way out, is basically what they term the decorated shed. Basically a building which is uh, by and large generic, which is seemingly straightforward to uh, 
function and structure, and that basically becomes expressive by virtue of an added layer of ornament which is actually uh, wrapped uh, at the very, very end. Um, indeed, the argument of the Anturis is that the book is a plea for functionalism. Um, but uh, the book can also be basically described indeed as a retroactive manifesto, or a, basically a book on a city that implies a manifesto. And indeed, the way in which the book is articulated is quite different. The book uh, claims basically has a peculiar structure of three chapters in its original uh, version. The first chapter is based on the, on the question, indeed, that was raised by the Venturis when teaching a studio at Yale in 1968, that uh, they would like to basically examine sprawl. Sprawl, a, an urban condition that has been, uh, indeed, uh, not properly addressed by, by the field. It has, had actually been banished or uh, understood as an anomaly of the city. The Venturis claim that they, basically architects are unable to understand sprawl owing to a shortage in their means of representation. In other words, plan sections, elevations, won't allow us to basically understand the city which is sprawled, because basically it's a city defined by speed, uh, and also because traditional means of representation don't chart elements like uh, billboards. Um, so basically the question for that studio, and which articulates the first chapter of the book, is the definition of new means of representation that would allow us to understand a city which is organized differently upon speed. And that's indeed what they do with the students at Yale. They travel to, um, to Las Vegas, and Las Vegas was seen basically as, a, as a, an LA in embryo. In other words, an LA in, in its pristine uh, condition of having one highway, the Strip. Um, and the section that basically they, they, they trace across uh, the Strip is basically Strip, billboard, parking lot, um, and the building of the casino behind which there's a desert. And as they say, basically, the billboards are uh, expensive and the architecture of the casino is, uh, is cheap. Um, so they basically, in that chapter, they produce an extraordinary array of uh, documents to basically invent new forms of, of representation, influenced by basically sequences or uh, basically um, documenting uh, the city at night, uh, a number of documents based on uh, work produced by uh, Ed Rocher and, and so on and so forth. It's basically a chapter devoted to invention in architectural representation that may lead potentially to understanding sprawl. Yet, in the chapter two, we realize that the book is not about uh, Las Vegas at all. It's a book which attempts to be a treatise on architectural symbolism, as they claim. Um, that's indeed the origin of the book. At that point, the chapter one disappears as if it were a Hitchcockian MacGuffin. Um, and what we realize now is that the book is a book about, indeed, uh, the, the effect of the absence of ornament in the post-war uh, modern trained uh, architects, and indeed the opposition between the decorated shed and the duck, what appears to be indeed a finding that the Venturis establish upon the stuff they documented in the first chapter as if it were indeed uh, a flea market. So the, the chapter two is basically organized around the argument of the duck and the decorated shed, and it's illustrated uh, in this uh, extraordinary drawing, which basically is a building. Uh, it's it, indeed the decorated shed is nothing else but the overlay of the expensive billboard by the, the strip and the cheap architecture behind the parking lot uh, into one building. And this building basically uh, is uh, seemingly functionless because it's responding to its uh, programmatic needs and structure in a very straightforward way and becomes monumental simply by virtue of claiming that it's monumental. Um, that is, it is indeed the definition of a decorated uh, shed. Then, of course, the, the book is followed by a third chapter where um, just uh, as uh, the Venturi, uh, Bob Venturi had done in Complex and Contradiction in Architecture and following a format uh, seemingly uh, coined by Palladio, they basically uh, resort to their own work as a way of illustrating the arguments they had uh, positioned in, in the book. And indeed, uh, the clearest illustration of, uh, of, the, of the decorated shed for the Venturi is the Institute for Scientific Information in Philadelphia, an extraordinarily, uh, um, um, uh, basically a box which has been uh, wrapped in a, in a punch card uh, on the main facade, and it basically doesn't relinquish the condition of being uh, a box. A project which, uh, by the way, is uh, extraordinarily uh, echoes um, um, the work of Herzog de Meron, particularly the Everest Library, uh, which indeed has, is basically a step forward in the problem of the decorated shed. So Deleuze New York basically uh, was just as Learning from Las Vegas, a book which was a one-off. Both books had basically no category at the moment they were actually published, and I think basically the retroactive uh, the definition of the retroactive manifesto in Cojas allows for them to be seen uh, through the same uh, um, filter. I would claim that New York has also a, 
a surrealist uh, precedent. Indeed, the very way in which Cole has uh, writes the history of New York is through the instrumentalization of Salvador Dalí's uh, Método Paranoico Crítico. Um, and I say it in Spanish because I usually make a mistake when I uh, translate it into English. Paranoid, paranoid critical activity. Yeah, there, there we go. Um, so um, the argument is basically uh, that, uh, and this is actually Salvador Dalí, instrumentalized by, by Colhas, that under the effect of paranoia, uh, one mobilizes any form of data as evidence of, uh, of what one suspects. In other words, paranoia is an extraordinarily creative uh, tool that could be uh, used precisely to, to invent, and the, the subject basically self-imposes uh, himself or herself a condition of paranoia to mobilize anything as uh, evidence of what uh, one is claiming. In the case of Colchas, basically the claim is that Manhattan was, uh, was planned. It was designed uh, and uh, in order for, um, for, it was designed according to a manifesto. In order for that manifesto to be materialized, it had to be kept secret. So it's actually the perfect paranoia, basically. Colchas is the one who has access to this information. He knows that the city was designed according to the manifesto, but of course no one else does, because if the manifesto had been revealed, it was probably not going to be uh, built. Um, so um, the, the, what he suspects is basically that this manifesto implied a city that was conceived uh, uh, in order to basically uh, take to an extreme the condition of artificiality. It was absolutely artificial. Um, it was based on the notion of the culture of congestion, or what he would basically term Manhattanism. Um, and it, the book, basically, Delirious New York, is nothing else than a history of a selection of the episodes in the history of New York that give proof that the city was indeed uh, designed according to a manifesto. The first episode is indeed Coney Island, where basically all of the techniques of Manhattanism are deployed uh, beforehand uh, so that if anything goes wrong, it doesn't affect Manhattan. It's basically far away from it. So it's basically a testing ground in the form of an amusement park. The second episode is the tracing of the grid 200 years ago. The third episode is the definition of an area in the middle of the grid, which is equivalent to uh, a park uh, that basically displaces the center of the city. Uh, and in addition to that, basically um, uh, declares by defining a park at its very center that nature, uh, which is preserved uh, in an artificial way, is never to be part of the city. Indeed, nature is not a component of the city. It's interesting to discuss also what are the effects of Manhattanism in our understanding of New York uh, today. Then the following uh, episode, which is indeed the most important one, is the, the, what he basically calls the, uh, the reproduction of the site. And this is basically the specific typology that Manhattan defines by virtue of the elevator. The elevator basically fosters a new form of architecture which is based on the simple repetition of the site n times upwards. Um, so basically the, the historical Hosmanian um, organization which was based on the higher you went up the more undesirable the conditions and which was actually simplified in the red carpet which was thick in the first floors and basically would be, get thinner then narrowed and then disappear towards the chambre de bonne uh, would be completely inverted the higher you would go uh, the more desirable the conditions but also the understanding that a skyscraper was not exactly a building but simply the repetition of a site upwards what gave the illusion that the building was consistent was the fact that it had an envelope around that would give you the idea that it was one entity. For Colhas, basically, uh, the interesting thing is that the architect who had been trained in the Beaux Arts is completely ill-equipped to design under Manhattanism because all the arts of articulation are completely uh, lost. What matters here is the ruthless extrusion of the site and thumbs upwards, and whenever the lift opens uh, its doors, it produces a new condition of site which is programmatically uh, um, autonomous and has no relationship to the program above or the program uh, underneath. The epitome of that is, of course, uh, the Danton Athletic Club, a building that Foucault has basically is indeed consistent on the outside, but actually quite boring, and in the inside, extraordinarily uh, unstable, since every program uh, um, is given to an, a different uh, package of floors. Anything can happen on any floor. Indeed, uh, eating oysters naked on the end floor with boxing gloves is the very description of the Danton Athletic Club. Uh, and uh, just as uh, in the case of uh, learning from Las Vegas, and in the case of uh, complacent contradiction, as well as Palladio, um, Cole has, has a, an appendix where he basically illustrates the lessons of, uh, of Deleuze New York. So in short, basically, the definition of a paranoia, um, the city has been designed according to a manifesto, and this manifesto implies a culture of congestion. Um, the finding, which is one of the episodes of, of, the, of the history that he basically highlights according to his own use of Dali's uh, 
paranoid, paranoid critical activity is that uh, what we see as buildings is indeed uh, the replication, the extrusion of the site in terms upwards. Um, the epitome of that condition is the Danton Athletic Club, whose section basically contains uh, the, the extraordinary um, um, split between uh, inner instability and outer uh, uh, stability. Indeed, an architecture which is devoted on the outside to, uh, to um, appearance and on the inside to performance, and which is uh, absolutely disjoint. And uh, the application, the illustration of the, of the concept in, uh, in the book is contained in the first of the projects uh, that illustrates the New York, which is um, the city of the captive globe, which is a number of, uh, of um, it's a, a gridded city where every building takes the full block and where each building uh, in the way that Manhattanism has been conceived celebrates uh, functionalism on the inside and formalism on the outside. The inside and the outside are forever disjoint, uh, an argument which is interesting enough not too far away from what's claimed in, uh, in learning from Las Vegas with the decorated shed. Um, in addition, the, the, the ultimate application of the project is not within the book, but it happens elsewhere. As a matter of fact, retroactive manifestos are never applied on the cities where they were uh, formulated. Um, and it's basically his project for La Villette, which uh, is uh, seemingly the overlay of, um, of the section of the Danton Athletic Club in order to produce an organization that was based on uh, autonomous bands, autonomous programs for a park which was conceived as indeed an urban park where there was more program than, uh, there was so, so much, such amount of program that there was indeed no space for the park and it had to be dealt with as program artificially. So uh, 10 years later, uh, Cole has basically formulated a new uh, project called the Contemporary City, 1988. The project uh, never happens, but it's actually formulated and it appears as, a, as a, indeed a formulation uh, in a Japanese uh, magazine, A plus U. Um, and here basically what Cole has uh, plans to do is a book equivalent to the Deleuze New York, another retroactive manifesto, but that would look basically at the Contemporary City, the city that architects had actually despised, the one architects of his generation he claimed was unable to, uh, to address. And he basically lists uh, three cities that the project was going to address. One, the Paris banlieue, the outskirts of Paris. Secondly, Atlanta. And thirdly, uh, Tokyo. The project doesn't uh, uh, ultimately happen, but of course it's uh, reincarnated in the Harvard project on the city uh, about seven years uh, later. Um, and of course we can also say that uh, the three episodes he uh, described to some extent were materialized. The episode on Paris happened through a number of Parisian uh, projects uh, which OMA formulated upon the idea of the void, um, as well as you could also say in the Ring Culture, uh, a book produced by Neuterlings uh, on the culture around, uh, of the, the highway around Paris and Antwerp, that was actually his thesis project at Delft uh, while working at OMA. Um, the, the text on Atlanta is the text that's, a, 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 that, that's published in small, medium, large, extra large. And then uh, the project on Tokyo, we could say, is basically extremely influential to people like Toyo Ito or Ate Bawao, who articulate basically, uh, again, 10 years of uh, scrutiny of the conditions of, the, of, of Tokyo from the simulated city to the city of void metabolism, as Ate Bawao would claim. In the year 2002, uh, a year after the call has basically uh, rights um, relearning from Las Vegas. Um, the, the format has already entered, uh, it has basically already proliferated, and I would claim that Bao Wow is probably the last contribution within the format in a cycle of uh, 30 years with uh, the dual contribution of Made in Tokyo and Pet uh, Architecture. In, um, by 2002, as I said, basically the, the moment that Cole has basically um, identified the genre is equivalent to the moment where basically the work of the interiors is revived. And in addition to that, the moment where basically the format is proliferating. Now, of course, as any uh, received idea, the received idea implies basically a proliferation where one of the key components is indeed uh, lost. And I would claim that the, the lost component, as soon as this format becomes recurrent and overused, is indeed the definition of an argument. So what we have is basically from 2002 onwards, uh, a number of, I, I, I actually adore Reinhold Martin's definition of the format, uh, books on cities by architects for architects. Um, which is uh, a number of books that basically document extensively urban conditions, but without uh, any form of disclosure. In other words, uh, a proliferation of chapter one of learning from Las Vegas without the actual claims that are made on chapter two, which is the main point of those books. As a matter of fact, the previous retroactive manifestos used to be actually quite thin books, uh, as opposed to its cliched version, uh, which basically proliferates in terms of its data. Uh, the cliche that goes hand in hand with it is the one of research, uh, and uh, with, which not only 
do not provide an argument, but basically take uh, the full flea market back home, uh, rather than um, the kind of selected uh, mask that Giacometti uh, chooses within the flea market, as uh, recounted by André Breton in uh, Mad Love, um, that basically allows for one specific problem of sculpture to be uh, addressed. So what happened to the architecture manifesto? Um, on the one hand, I would say basically there's a, a perpetuation of its retroactive form without the definition of arguments. On the other hand, there's a revival of its original form, but completely domesticated without uh, the definition of a collective project or of any kind of critical uh, position. So perhaps uh, one suggestion would be now to basically redefine the question and basically uh, um, address precisely what happened uh, to the definition of positions uh, within the field, positions that imply a program, that imply a collective approach, and that by definition imply also a polemical uh, uh, stance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, I have a, a, a actually slightly long preamble before I turn to the um, uh, three manifestos for which images um, uh, are, are appearing here on the screen. Um, so to begin, our only directive for today's event was to respond to the question that is simultaneously the title, what happened to the architectural manifesto? As a directive, it's fantastically and um, seductively ambiguous. Are we being called upon to reflect on the recent history of the genre, to examine or clarify what happened to it and why, or to doubt, question, or problematize the continuing efficacies of manifestos by tracing the terms of their unfortunate demise? Or is it rather a call to action, even a request to launch a new manifesto, perhaps a manifesto about architectural manifestos, in an attempt to resist any such narrative of decline or loss, an attempt then to reinvigorate contemporary debates by mobilizing the polemical rhetoric of urgency so familiar from the architectural manifesto. In some sense, this ambiguity also calls on the speaker to identify from which discursive mode she or he speaks, a task that is less than straightforward given the convoluted topology or sort of the interpenetrating matrix that characterized both historical and theoretical discourse in architecture as well as architectural manifestos throughout the 20th century. For of course, on the one hand, we often find a manifesto-like proclamation of contemporary stakes within historical writing, even if not overtly taking the form of a declaration, and on the other, a level of historical self-consciousness informing architectural manifestos uh, to which Tony spoke so eloquently. This is not, of course, to suggest that the writing of history and that of manifestos have been or should be collapsed, or that they are without distinctiveness. Rather, it's to posit the importance of the ongoing encounter and mutual displacement or shifting which arises through such a productively conflictual dialogue or relationship. So the question also what happened to the architectural manifesto seems nevertheless to remain uh, haunted, we might say, by the sense that something about the discursive and historical context from which manifestos are launched has indeed changed. And the heroic voice proper to the manifesto genre as it drove modernist and avant-garde polemics, refutations, and counterclaims no longer resonates simply as heroic. There's the looming impression that our perception or reception of such performances, whether played out in oral proclamations, print-based media, exhibitions, or other forms of actualization and dissemination, has been irrevocably altered. One might speculate in the first instance whether or not this feeling has arisen on account of their association not only with progressive tendencies, but also with reactionary ideologies and, of course, forces of violence and exclusion during the 20th century. Moreover, in the United States, at least since the early 70s, there's the specter of the tournament model of discourse favored by the neoconservatives and the polarizing declarative polemics of right-wing pundits and demagogues to contend with, if not simply to avoid partaking in. But it's not simply the association with less than progressive tendencies that has rendered the bombast of the manifesto troubling. 
If this were the case, then, of course, the futurist manifestos of the early 20th century would have been cast rather differently as founding moments of art and architectural manifestos, or at least the championing of their heroism would, in retrospect, be more profoundly disturbing. We are, however, left with the question of whether, today, the heroic rhetoric and chest pounding over heartfelt ideals now simply or irreversibly resonates with the dramatic prose of right-wing demagogues or in the wake of feminist and gender struggles with the machismo they identified at work within largely heteronormative male-dominated fields. But I would not, of course, want to see the potential of launching polemical challenges to the discipline to reactionary tendencies, let alone to suggest that any such strategy was doomed to rhetorical co-optation by the right. Far from it. Of course, I think the conceptual and theoretical register within which manifestos operate upon present conditions and with some precision is one of the key weapons uh, in the arsenal of critical practice. In the second instance, however, as a historian, I want to ask whether we can identify certain aspects of the manifesto or certain types of manifestos that might have lent the genre too easily to the foreclosure of critical potentialities and their recuperation as demagoguery. And here, uh, I also want to turn at the risk of reiterating what Craig said uh, to Charles Jenks, uh, or to, more specifically to his highly symptomatic endeavor to define the architectural manifesto as a violent, incantatory, sectarian call to order in the volcano and the tablet, his introduction to theories and manifestos of contemporary architecture. So Jenks characterized the genre, or as he put it, the art form, in terms of an emotionally charged, even biblical crusade, bent at once on destruction of an enemy or outsider, the exclusion of difference, and the establishment of new orthodoxies. Manifestos inspire fear in order to create unity and orthodoxy, he posited, additionally clarifying that it was, and I quote again, the irresistible display of violence and strength which makes the manifesto memorable and psychologically impressive. Of their formal characteristics, he noted that manifestos were repetitive and hypnotic, that they were magic words written on the run and exhibiting an hysterical telegraphic quality. For Jenks, then, it was the collusion between fear-mongering, uh, the volcano in his title, which spoke to the explosion of emotion, and the institutionalization of new norms, its counterpart, the tablet, uh, which referenced, as he put it, the establishment of laws and theories that characterized a manifesto. Concluding, Jenks tied this opportunistic logic of promoting fear to the once utopian figure of changing the world, but here it's not specifying its political character. As he explained, and I quote, crisis or the feeling of imminent catastrophe is one more reason why the volcano in a deep, uh, is a deep metaphor as the tablet, is as deep a metaphor as the tablet, pure theory, for without the motive to change the world, the manifesto would not be written. So what then, we might ask, did gents imagine such fear-mongering to be in the service of? What was at stake in such attempts to change the world, to establish new laws? So to be clear, again, I'm not implying here that there's something constitutive about the genre on account of Jenks' oppositional definition, but I want to ask if there are manifestos that operate otherwise to different ends, those which undermine or differently articulate themselves with respect to historical forces and discourses as well as to established forms of institutional power. Are there not other types of manifestos, wayward versions or ironic appropriations of the genre? Or can we identify, and of course there are, yeah, or can we identify borderline examples that might have us asking, how on earth did it come to look like that? Can we find examples of manifestos that destabilize the genre from within, even allow us to significantly redefine it? while not discounting the distinct possibility that it might even be Jenks' astounding ability to turn all polemic into pure platitudes, to subsume distinct discourses into his monstrous categories that has killed the efficacy and specificity of the manifesto in architectural discourse, I still want to ask if there are other possible lives. So to test these lines of questioning then, and of course not to answer them so much, I want to bring in three examples that do not appear in Jenks's and Kopp's otherwise uh, quite extensive selection. Open Land, a manifesto. Leslie Kane Wiseman's Women's Environmental Rights, a manifesto. And Luc Deleur's Manifesto on Urban Planning. All have an air of urgency and in this sense resonate with Jenks's definitions. 
But in, in addressing pressing questions of their historical moment, uh, particularly as we'll see environmental concerns as they relate to the discipline of architecture, each departs from his formulation in an instructive manner. And also just to say, you know, we're looking at hippies and, uh, and other such thing. I'm not putting these on the table necessarily as examples of more important manifestos um, uh, or even as examples that are going to answer these questions, but for the degree to which they speak to the pressure of historical forces upon the discipline as manifest, of course, in the manifesto in marking its sense of urgency. So Open Land, a manifesto, was not written by architects, but by the communards of Morningstar Commune and Wheeler's Ranch. Yet it was a manifesto concerned quite specifically with the impact of architecture upon one's body and one's psyche. While pervaded by the mysticism and problematic identifications characteristic of hippie culture, I introduce it here as an example of a manifesto that staged a departure from extant institutions without indicating a means of return or the, or, or the establishment of a new orthodoxy. The open land movement emerged in Northern California in the mid to late 1960s in reaction to what its earliest proponents, Lou Gottlieb and Ramon Sender, both actually uh, musicians working with electronic technologies, uh, in response to what they called cybernation. Uh, responding at once to the imminent possibility that human labor had been rendered unnecessary on account of automation, and that those same technologies harbored the threat of atomic and nuclear warfare, and with it a forced return to a pre-industrial condition, they adopted an ethos of voluntary primitivism, a performance of survival strategies or anticipatory experimental testing of alternative forms of life. Central to this testing were attempts to cede private property rights to a domain involving communal stewardship of the land, to make land available rent-free for anyone to use, to open a space without governmental regulation, or as they put it, with no authorities and no rules. Offering her impressions of Willis Ranch, journalist Sarah Davidson recalled that there was a sign near the community garden reading, permit not required to settle here. Many had taken up the call to occupy land free of charge, building makeshift structures or setting up temporary dwellings from tents and teepees to customized school buses and vans within this ambiguous territorial zone. The dwellings Davidson wrote of the scene she encountered are straight out of dog patch, old boards nailed unevenly together, odd pieces of plastic strung across poles to make wobbly igloos, the round stove pipes both poking out the side. Most have dirt floors, though the better ones have wood. The occupants themselves had a simile poverty-ridden, even pre-industrial, if theatrical appearance, wearing, as she put it, hillbilly clothes with funny hats, outfits she also described as pioneer clothes. So exodus from official systems of managing land and the built environment, from property rights uh, and trespass laws to building codes, as well as health and safety regulations, were not as easy as declaring Permanent, uh, permit not required to settle here. Indeed, the sign served less as a performative or speech act in the sense theorized by J.L. Austin, actually freeing the land for the need for permits, than it did as a polemical and political gesture. And the local authorities soon fought back, giving rise to what came to be known as code wars, and with them an escalating set of tactical and counter-tactical maneuvers between the commune on the one hand and the state and local uh, governing institutions on the other. After initially trying to charge the communards uh, with harboring dangerous persons, then repeatedly rounding them up and arresting them for health and safety violations, government agencies eventually bulldozed the ad hoc settlements at both sites. So it was in this embattled context that Open Land, a manifesto, was written around 1970, a text recounting that these structures had been a principal means for articulating and testing their alternative modes of life, strategic vehicles in their attempts to withdraw from the state's regulation of the environment, weapons, as they put it, in the battle over opening land. As more people arrived, the manifesto recounted, Sonoma County started a broad-based policy of repressions, including a punitive and discriminatory enforcement of the health and building codes, i.e. letting people live in poverty elsewhere, but not here. Even teepees and tents were disallowed, they reported, going on to note the state's acts of rezoning the properties, revoking rights of way access, instituting new laws against the formation of non-normative households, and other tactics uh, to try and break up the commune. So the vehemence then of the state's response itself indicates that at stake uh, was far more than ensuring the health and safety of those adopting a lifestyle of voluntary primitivism. 
So one section of the manifesto entitled Our Beleaguered Homes further outlined their ethos of no-code homes. How about building yourself a house? No, no, you don't need money, architects, plans, permits. Why not use what's there? Restrictive codes on home building, they insisted, make it just about impossible to build a code home that doesn't sterilize, insulate, and rigidify the inhabitants. So it falls down the, in the first one, you know, the next one won't, um, the second one won't, dirt, fleas are, dirt floors are easy to keep clean, domes are full of light and air. So if the cost of materials and do-it-yourself ethos certainly informed the non-normative character of the ad hoc constructions, the manifesto reveals that teepees, lean-tos, tents, open-sided A-frames, etc., were not simply the product of a lack of building expertise, uh, although this did actually, uh, of course, factor in. Rejecting normative and scientifically justified approaches not only to housing but also to health, hygiene, education, sanitation, birth rates, and labor, open land communards were not to stress fighting for access to or equitable inclusion within the system. Rather, they were actively withdrawing from the institutions, practices, and sites through which micropolitical techniques of power had developed under a modern form of governmental rationality. They were withdrawing from the points at which that logic systematically met the body and psyche of the contemporary subject in their everyday lives and specifically in architecture. Open land thus implicitly questioned the relation between the state's more benevolent role in ensuring the health and welfare of its citizens and the forms of control it exerted over them in the name of maintaining productivity, or more precisely, maintaining profitability for the capitalist machine. Architecture in turn served as a tactical vehicle then, protesting the occupation of a counter-environment, again tactical weapons in a war against the state's administration of dwelling and hence of bodies through regulatory codes. So my second example, briefly, uh, Wiseman's Women's Environmental Rights, a manifesto, emerges from within an architectural context, but similarly recognizes, we might say, a matrix of biopolitical forces at work within architecture and the forms of life it sustains, reading them in terms of environmental oppression. Appearing in Heresies 2, a special issue of this feminist journal called, as you see here, Women in Architecture, the manifesto begins, and the language of the manifesto, be it acknowledged, the man-made environment which surround us reinforce conventional patriarchal definitions of women's role in society and spatially imprint these sexist messages on our daughters and sons. Then going on under the subtitle, Architecture as Icon, Westman refers in turn to the built environment as a living archaeology through which we can extract the priorities and beliefs of the decision makers of our society. So what emerges then in the remaining parts of the manifesto is a fascinating split between calls for reform to take place within the system through mobilizing architectural expertise. So for instance, she says, we must demand the right to architectural settings uh, which will support the essential needs of all women and something closer to the exodus of the, of the open land communes. In the context of calling for the appropriation, alternative use, and even radical transformation of architectural spaces to counter social inequity and disempowerment, Wiseman includes a statement issued in the wake of attempting to occupy an abandoned building in the East Village. To cite a couple of lines, it reads, because we want to develop our own culture, because we refuse to have equal rights in a corrupt system, we took over a building to put into action uh, uh, with women those essential th things essential to women, health care, uh, child care, I uh, love this idea of food conspiracy, etc. For this reason, she goes on, we were busted because we are women acting independently of men, independently of the system. So I think at stake here uh, in both responses, and uh, uh, what I'm sort of interested in is the way it marks sort of both sides uh, of American feminism at this moment, um, yeah, both a sort of reformist and a revolutionary side, is a critique, again, of the manner in which architecture, uh, as they saw it, served as a technique of power in forming or sustaining particular forms of life. But there was also, as the other side of a manifesto, a hope that it could operate otherwise, even serve to facilitate a type of disinvestment from such environmental forces, hence the need for a manifesto. Yeah, yeah, the other side of the claim. So third, um, uh, I want to introduce Deleuze's 1980 Urban Planning Manifesto, a retroactive manifesto launched less as a new polemic or to announce a change than to consolidate ideas from the previous decade, hence belying the contemporaneity of the manifesto form. Deleuze's manifesto returned to themes dating back to his earliest polemic as top office, in particular the limited land on planet Earth, the pressures of population growth and urbanization on food production, and the foreclosure, as he saw it, of any remaining commons. 
1970, when top office was formed, questions of environmental catastrophe and population growth were at the forefront of public debate, fueled by the survivalist rhetoric of Buckminster Fuller, whose utopia or oblivion, the prospects for humanity had appeared the year earlier, and of course, Stanford biology professor Paul Ehrlich's best-selling uh, Neo-Malthusian, The Population Bomb of 1968. This was also the year Stuart Brand, a former student of Ehrlich and avowed uh, disciple of Fuller, launched the Whole Earth Catalog, the cover featuring an iconic image of NASA's Apollo missions, an image, of course, of Earth from outer space all would leave a profound mark on Deleur. For him, this new planetary consciousness meant that architecture and urbanism could no longer operate at the scale of housing or even the town, as he believed to characterize modernism. Rather, as he put it, architecture would now have to be treated on a global scale. As he explained in another manifesto entitled uh, a, t a Task for Contemporary Architecture, uh, he said, the consumer society requires a different approach to the production society of the beginning of this century. The mid-60s and early 70s was a period full of changes, social and technical as well as artistic. Le Corbusier and Mies died. The first communication satellites were launched, enabling us to see events from all over the world in real time on our home TV screen, including the man's first landing on the moon. Concepts such as Global Village and Spaceship Earth were in use. The concept ecology, thinking about Earth, was in general use by the time of the Club of Rome's report, which emphasized the limit of the Earth and its mineral resources. So Dula invoked the popular duo of world thinking, McLuhan's Global Village and Fuller's Spaceship Earth, on a number of occasions, always making it clear that what he called world planning or urbanism was indebted to both and also inextricably connected to the so-called communication revolution. He also repeatedly clarified, however, that urbanism was not directed toward designing or managing the Earth at a global scale, as in something like Fuller's World Game, but rather to conceiving of a model of design that was attentive to the scale of the Earth and its interconnectedness. Hence his ironic commentary, this is one of a series of, of, of pros, uh, projects or proposals, his ironic commentary on global ecological independence appearing in two of these proposals, uh, and I quote, the proposal for an international compost heap in the Sahara is, for instance, an ecological project on a planetary scale. By shipping all vegetable waste to the Sahara, where it dehydrates quickly and becomes dust, the winds from the Sahara will carry particles that will automatically fertilize our farmland in Europe. Uh, he says, I also wrote a proposal to shoot nuclear waste to the sun. Obviously, the sun is the best location to dump our nuclear waste. <laughs> yeah, so speaking to, anyway. So suggesting that human settlement might shift from land to ocean, De De Ocean's Deleuze 1980 manifesto also alluded to his very first project, a 1972 competition entry entitled Mobile Medium University. The competition was launched in the wake of the decision to decentralize the Belgian university system, a move to low red as yet another threat posed to agricultural land by development. He responded via proposal to situate the university at sea to produce an institution literally traveling the globe upon three recycled aircraft carriers supplemented by no less than 33 helicopters and, as he put it, communication media. A progressive policy, he explained, would attempt to burden the earth with as little ballast as possible. In addition to such environmental claims were pedagogical ambitions articulated as geopolitical ones. It seems to me, he remarked, that a university that sails around the world with its pupils, connected via electronic media, diplomatizes real world citizens within an expanded view of the world. In another drawing that you see here on the right, when ironically referencing posters associated with the occupation of the Parisian uh, uh, called de Beaux Arts in May 68, we find again the exclamation, during my studies the UI, at the UIA, I was all over the world. I'm a real international, not a consumer's diploma. Deleuze's choice of aircraft carriers, just briefly, could not have failed to resonate with their use in the Vietnam War at this moment as it spread into Cambodia. From aircast carriers were, of course, launched fighter bombers uh, whose packages included not only incendiary bombs, but also the defoliants and chemical weapons responsible for the ecocide in Indochina. Such warships, if certainly abundant then, were hardly um, uh, obsolescent, as he claimed. 
So this project formed part of a larger one that I want to speak to very quickly called Mobile Medium Architecture, the manifesto for which appeared not in public circulation, but in a private scrapbook in which the connections between American militarism, expanding communication technologies and transportation infrastructures and environmental concerns becomes far more explicit. After this, images of protesters with video cameras and even the IBM 96-column uh, punch card tucked into the inside of the dust jacket, we find a manifesto about mobility. It reads, mobile, architecture, medium, medium man, human, energy to energy belt to energy clothing, man plus energy, can be plugged into all media. It's a sort of cyborg manifesto. Minimize transport by maximizing communication. Communication equals transport by K. Communication divided by transport equals K. On the next spread, we find Mobile Medium University in the company of two enigmatic comments regarding the communication matrix within which this new mobility and the new medium man would operate. The first reads, our friend has no address. Always changing coordinates to find your friend. You will have to communicate more intensely. Address book uh, becomes coordinator phone, coordinator video suggesting that such apparent liberty to move about was suspended within a regulatory system, geared, however, towards increasing control. The second comment inscribed immediately below reads, if the administration keeps track of your coordinates, the system is ever again worn out, or always and already worn out. So I have a lot to say about this work, of course, uh, but here I just want to flag two elements. First, Deleuze's recasting of the name of top office, which actually stood for turn on planning, as turn on promotion that you see on the right, um, and also the launching in turn of a realized work, Mobile Arch uh, Medium Architecture Promotion, that you see written on the car here, uh, a customized uh, Opal Blitz, which appears in various guises in the scrapbook. These include, as you see here, in association with mobile homes uh, and alternative technology, energy technologies, and even as a drawing that seems to invert Hans Hollein's Rolls-Royce Grill on Wall Street of 1966. Finally, and again making connections to the war in Vietnam, it appears opposite a photograph of John Lennon and Yoko Ono's Ledinger Dairy March 69 week-long bed-in in Amsterdam. So if we take seriously the implied uh, reference to Timothy Leary's catchy phrase, turn on, tune in, drop out, we might speculate that Deleu is proposing that once a practice like architecture had been turned on to a new consciousness, which whether aided by psychedelic drugs or not, would aim to achieve a departure from conventional modes of perception, it could in turn tune in to the world around it and even drop out or relinquish connections to the capitalist system and refuse to participate within its institutions and modes of life. To some degree, I think this is what's going on, but there are further complications, especially as it encountered architecture. Can architecture or planning drop out? It's not, of course, is this not, of course, a contradiction in terms, even a category mistake, that is, if architecture succeeded in withdrawing from the long-standing roles that's played in environmental control in the service of capitalism and the state, would it still be architecture? Deleur was certainly struggling with these questions. In a text entitled Spaceship Earth, he argued, urban planning and architecture are always a structural and three-dimensional packaging of socially dominant attitudes, and in this way, the contemporary urbanization of the world urbanization emanates from the hegemony of capitalism with its high consumption and low use of space. And it's here that I want to return briefly to his urban planning manifesto, which ends by stressing that in an age characterized by massive environmental pressures, the critical task of the town planner or architect, what he called the urban planner, had radically transformed, and he actually likens this transformation, to the profound impact of photography on the pictorial function of Western painting. The architect's role, he argued, had now translated into the dissemination of information, and I quote, he is a medium, a trendsetter and or town fool. He designs, publishes, performs, shows, realizes or plays. The urban planner, he added in concluding, has become primarily a theoretician who in rare cases realizes his visionary views on the spaces of planet Earth. As Deleu insisted elsewhere, he was not proposing that architects drop out, but rather that they work in a conceptual or experimental register to launch images or ideas or a counter logic, a type of counter conduct, seeking to facilitate a critical self-consciousness regarding the discipline's relation to contemporary forces, and that they do so in a manner promoting structural transformation from within the system, even, as he noted, at the level of policy. 
so to conclude in uh, literally a minute, uh, at stake in asking then what happened to the architectural manifesto here is not to find an answer in a definitive sense, but rather to use the process of questioning as a vehicle through which to articulate or recover the possibility of manifestos operating otherwise, refusing the normative impetus stressed by Jenks and their role of enforcing purity and orthodoxy. These admittedly rather marginal examples, and I think we could have taken examples from Jenks' anthology, suggest, for instance, the possibilities that manifestos might not only assume a strictly oppositional stance, but could also launch critical contradictions that are not so easily resolved, particularly with respect to the process of gaining institutional power, or even that stage a tactical exodus from that very milieu, if only momentarily. Could a manifesto involve the insertion of risk or of troubling as such, rather than simply opposition? Can manifestos stress the articulation of apparias rather than truth claims, something we find, of course, in the history of architectural manifestos, but absent in Jenks' uh, definition? More particularly, I think such a process might serve to stress the need for different definitions, definitions that intentionally depart from Jenks' ethos of alarmist violence and the establishment of norms. For the manifesto does seem, on the one hand, to be an archaism from an earlier period of modernity. But on the other hand, like print media itself, it's an archaism that might retain a contemporary function, prompting us also to ask what might happen to the architectural manifesto, to ask how, again, it might be defined otherwise or differently. Thank you. Okay, we're running just a, sh a tad late, so we will uh, try and keep it quick. But just uh, to begin, uh, to just to thank you all for terrific uh, and thought-provoking presentations, I would just maybe uh, put a couple questions on the table. I was interested, uh, actually, in maybe uh, contrasting uh, Enrique and Tony's presentation as a particular starting point. I really appreciated uh, your attempt to actually ground this uh, account of the manifesto in a kind of autonomy. Uh, and to drive a wedge, let's say, between the manifesto as a genre and the treatise. And I was struck how, uh, Enrique, in your presentation, those two terms came up again, and they came up in very much in the same object, right, in the two halves of complexity and contradiction, the first half which you describe as a manifesto, and the second half which you describe as a treatise. And for you, if I'm uh, understanding correctly, it's those two things actually being in a kind of tight conversation that forces the forces the question of reinventing a new kind of representation to deal with the anomalous object, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, interesting, I'm interested to see if you guys could speak to each other. Tony, you're advocating a, a position of autonomy, a strategic well, one in a sense for arguing today, and Enrique, you're kind of actually pointing at the necessary for these two things, the treatise and the manifesto to be together. Well, in, in the first place, I think, yeah, I think the, the strategic um, idea of an autonomous genre uh, which defines itself through a series of, uh, of performative acts mm. um, allows for the kinds of what I would call counter manifestos mm -hmm. that, uh, that Felicity was talking about. In other words, it forces that. It also forces uh, someone like Venturi, who doesn't want to do a manifesto at all, to have to call it a gentle manifesto, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and mm. it probably forces uh, Rem, who again doesn't want to do a manifesto at all, to call it a retroactive manifesto. In that sense, I think the, f the, the, the generic, uh, the, the, in other words, the genre manifesto have a, has an extraordinary productive quality. And I think that's the, the force of, of Marx and Marinetti. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the Marinetti who is consciously uh, constructing his manifesto as, uh, as the symbolists were not, 
um, against and with and for Marx mm -hmm. as the cultural productive force, those two manifestos, to me, define a genre which are uh, almost literally continued and only those, only those um, uh, manifestations of the genre which are called manifesto, to me, are uh, self-consciously uh, devoted to that genre. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important. I think it's important that some people call themselves, you know, the program for something, or the mm -hmm. tenets of something, or the principles of something, which have mergings with theory, with uh, analysis, with historicization of the genre, and so on. But I think it's very important that we autonomize the, the, the genre in order to see its fundamental productive processes, you know, for better or for worse. I mean, what, what I find interesting about the retroactive manifesto is the, the fact that I think um, these were enacted by, let's say, Venturi and Colhas and being identified by Colhas retrospectively. So basically, mm -hmm. I think they are really manifestos that have been written differently. They mm -hmm. were not produced differently. So they say evidence precedes the argument in the book, but probably not in the, in the formulation of the argument. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I mean, I, I, I very much insist on the, on the surrealist precedent in all these exercises, but the surrealist precedent is one where you basically, you can afford just to find rather than to look for, as Picasso said, mm -hmm. only if you know, if you have a position. In other words, basically, I think the, the, the important thing about retroactive manifesto is that it's extraordinarily productive uh, before, it's, uh, before it's ossified in the definition of 2001 as books on cities that imply a manifesto. Mm -hmm. um, because let's say, owing to the fact that Venturi and, uh, and Koch has belonged to generations where an Arctic had to be first and foremost positioned, even though you would disguise it, those books are written as manifesto, let's say, as they're elaborated as manifestos, but disguised in their construction. At best, let's say, you could say that if it was the evidence preceded the argument, the evidence was uh, stuff that, let's say, allowed for a certain finding. But, but I would say that strictly they remain within the level of the manifesto. I would say that after 2002, um, once this genre is popularized, once the Venturis are basically relieved by, uh, by, by Kohas, what you have is a number of books on cities that really uh, accumulate data of, let's say, produced by generations which are not naturally positioned. So what you get is neither a, manif a retroactive manifesto nor, um, nor a book on a city. Mm -hmm. It's basically books on stuff. <laughs> books on stuff, it's basically the... the, the I, I, I insist again on the, metaf on the metaphor of the, of the surrealist. It's basically an uncertain surrealist that takes the full free market back home. Or retroactively, <laughs> stuff as books. Right, 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 <laughs> exactly. But, but I do think there's a distinction when you talk about surrealism to be made between the kind of, um, between the surrealist manifesto of, um, of a Breton and the uh, very different uh, political stance of an Aragon. Mm -hmm. And I think within surrealism you have Dali, you have Breton, and you have Aragon, and there are three very different stances towards the production of manifestos, right. uh, politically, culturally, and, uh, and, and yeah. painterly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Dali is deeply steeped in Lacan uh, through Minotaur and through his friendships, right? And therefore paranoia becomes absolutely uh, critical mm -hmm. for, for him, and thereby the manifesto is, is always subverted uh, by the, uh, the psychotic division of the, of, the, of the personality and the ultimately paranoid split personality that Lacan produces, right? Whereas for uh, uh, Breton, it's a, it's a function of dreams, and for Aragon, it's a function of died-in-the-world died communism. Right. I mean, I, I think that the, the, the point I want to emphasize was basically primarily stuff which is ordinary and by being disclosed become extraordinary. The fact, I mean, the, the chance encounter, the umbrella and the sewing machine right. on the dissecting so table, so the fact that song. stuff which is uh, ordinary by virtue of being uh, displaced or simply identified, let's say it, that evidence could become ecstatic for the formulation of an argument. So it's, yeah. it's basically, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a series of manifestos that are constructed upon the logic of a finding, a trip or a, a walk and, and an, a sudden awareness of a problem. But that awareness was already positioned uh, in a very, um, let's say, traditional manifesto-like way. Because indeed, what the Venturis find in learning from Las Vegas is an argument regarding the question of symbolism precisely at the beginning of the 70s, where basic semiotics captures the debate. And what Cole has finds in Deleuze, New York, is a question regarding 
um, the, um, the suspension between the relation between of form and function that has alre had already been questioned at the time as well. So basically, what they find is, is a new angle on a topic they had already been discussing before traveling. But I would say the shift in the form is from the manifesto to the manifest. Hmm. And the manifest makes things clear. Right. The manifesto says what you have to do about it. And, I, hmm. and, and the question there, I think, is very different. Right, right, right. So, I mean, I, just to uh, add to that, I mean, I um, was, of course, a little bit nervous when you were um, articulating uh, such a precise history, you know, definite history of the manifesto and the terms. Um, but I guess I, I, I um, wanted to ask what happens when, for instance, in the case of some of my examples, somebody claims it's a manifesto, even if, of course, it's not entirely within uh, the genre, yeah, let's mm -hmm. say. Like, what happens in that sort of appropriation? I mean, like the Open Land Manifesto. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's more a type of history than it is a manifesto. The manifestos that really happened earlier, actually, in the, um, in the courtroom and elsewhere. And so I was wondering, does this I'll, I'll allow give you this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there is a transmutation, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a rewriting as... as as, as you said, mm -hmm, of, yeah. of, of, of the genre over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to, um, ex what we're trying to historically explain in retrospect, the retroactive, mm -hmm. we're trying historically to explain uh, why the particular form of, uh, of either, you know, surrealism, mm -hmm. any of the previous uh, political and cultural manifestos, all this kind mm -hmm, of manifesto, mm -hmm. has been in a sense de displaced mm -hmm, in yeah. terms of uh, architectural writing, if you like. I mean, we're really talking about architectural mm -hmm. writing, right? Yeah. So I, I would say that, you know, we can see that in certain architectural writing there is a manifesto quality, but the actual, mm -hmm. the, the existence of the short, pithy, you know, um, you know, it'd be interesting mm -hmm. if, uh, if one could develop a culture of Twitter manifestos, right? Mm -hmm. Where 140 mm -hmm. 140 word manifestos. That, mm -hmm. would, that would actually relieve us of having to read a thousand pages. <laughs> <laughs> Felicity, in your, in your presentation, uh, I was really struck by how precisely what you're, I think, alluding to in the last question, uh, the manifesto is not necessarily a genre, but in a sense a kind of uh, attempt to claim particular structures or particular, particular uh, buildings as architecture. And that is and mm -hmm. for very particular political reasons. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that in terms of uh, how you see that sitting in relationship to the question of the genre. Uh, because this is kind of a performative act, right? Which does relate to the history of declarations and manifestos, but it's very mm. different from the kind of genre I've been talking about. Yeah, no, I guess um, um, one thing I was trying to trace in these three examples that they shared was um, uh, a reading, as I, you know, pointed to, you know, Foucault's um, uh, discourse on, on biopolitics and governmentality, a reading of architecture, uh, you know, as invested in these techniques of power and an mm -hmm. attempt to disarticulate that or disinvest that, or I mean, so, so this was really the status of the architectural object that played out in um, the three sort of examples that I wanted to put on the table, and certainly then the suggestion that with the um, uh, the, let's say, sort of positive or transformative ambition of a manifesto that, that there might be some other, uh, you know, potential there, let's say, mm -hmm. or at least a way of operating within that that, that was less determining. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's really where the status of the... I don't know if that answers your no, question. I think that's it what does. I, I mean, the direction I was thinking, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, in the sense that each of these objects by being declared architecture, in a sense, mm -hmm. are being declared as articulate objects, yes, right? As correct. things that actually speak in yes. a certain sense. And I wouldn't, couldn't help but think of the fact that the ruling the other day about the camp yes. uh, not being speech, right? Yes. It's that same, uh, yes, yes. I, I mean, all of the images you showed made me think of yes. the demolition of Zuccotti Park, well, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Not architecture not and therefore architecture. not speech. Yes. You know, this kind of... Uh, mm -hmm. Not cultural. And actually, um, one of the uh, tactics the Morningstar commune tried to use after firstly trying to deed the land to God and the uh, court had uh, all sorts of troubles with this because the judge couldn't actually say that God didn't exist and you know, wasn't <laughs> a, for a being and all the rest of it. But, um, um, but one of the, uh, the next uh, technique or strategies was to declare it a type of vernacular culture, yeah? mm. like to insist that it had a sort of 
status um, uh, as a yeah, as yeah. A, a emanation of culture as such, and that therefore it could be uh, given to the state as a sort of open air museum, and and, mm -hmm. and so and, and this was also refused as no, it's not culture, yeah, no, it's not architecture, it's not. Yeah, uh, and I think this was an interesting tactic as well. Mm -hmm. I, I have a suggestion to make. I, I, I think uh, for the day, although yeah. unfortunately I can't stay all through the day, one of the obligations of the conference is to prove, if at all possible, that this is not another revival of the problem of the manifesto, or the 60s, basically. Hmm. <laughs> that, that if the manifesto is at stake, it has to do with the problem today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, th I would say that that should be a challenge for, for the day. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. Shall we open it up in that spirit to the, uh, to the audience for questions? Briefly, so we can move on. Yes, briefly. Who has the first question? I think sometimes it has, sorry, I think yep. sometimes a, a, an evaluation historically or even um, sort of paradigmatically in the way we've all, you know, <coughs> you know, I've said it could be this, you've said it could be that, right. you've said it could be this, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important clearing ground. I mean, uh, after all, Marx and Engels did the same thing with the utopian socialism, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe we're doing the same thing with utopian manifestism. Right. You know? mm -hmm. And at a certain point that to turn to the problems of today, we have to, in fact, uh, historicize the past in such a way that only those moments of the past that can be activated again return to help right. Right. Mm -hmm. project our own critical understanding of the present. And so I, that, I, and for me, looking at this uh, whole spectrum, just thinking about this problem, it became you know, very evident that one of the things that, uh, that is needed is a kind of uh, re-understanding of what architectural writing is all about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. Reading uh, all the treatises or the attempts to rewrite the treatise after the 60s when mm -hmm. the manifesto becomes in Disraeli, right? Um, you begin to realize that the, there is a kind of flailing in architectural writing, the search for authority here or there or there or there, and a very, very un, un, imprecise vision of where architecture can operate at any one point, uh, usually in resistance to where it is operating at that point, right? So I think, you know, we could, in fact, develop a way of thinking about architectural writing, which has certain sort of didactic purposes within it, which may not be manifesto purposes, but may be clear definitions of purpose in relationship to, to process in relationship to product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not <laughs> <laughs> and also, I would add just to, to the tension that always has with modes of dissemination, it seems to me that is also one of the motors of, of the way in which the kind of uh, clarity of certain points in writing always relates sometimes to the, to the modes of dissemination, the newspaper being a particular way in which journalistic speech was actually incorporated into the manifesto by that. And you know, so, right. so what about this? A specter is haunting globalism, <laughs> parametricism. Terrific. <laughs> yeah, there's a question in the back. Is that on? I can't hear, sorry. I don't, don't think the mic's on. Okay, okay I'll, I'll just try to ask the question. could be useful or possible or welcomed? Is that a question for one person in particular or? Oh, <laughs> okay. I, you know, Craig, when you talked about uh, the Occupy movement mm -hmm. and the, in a sense, the refusal to write a single manifesto, I mean, that's the major problematic, isn't it? I mean, yeah. the question of, uh, of is there a single unifying purpose given the heterogeneity of, of critical operations that are necessary to actually um, go forward critically. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that is a key question that, that that movement has raised. And in some senses, the resistance to the manifesto is not, it's a resistance to having a leader that would articulate one position. There are actually manifestos written. And right. to me, what's interesting about that is something like the way it's operating through these slogans. And one particular slogan will actually then take on a kind of manifesto quality by the way it's reiterated by many others. If you think of uh, the 99% Tumblr, for instance, where th that one slogan is actually the platform by which everybody sends in these short letters using that slogan, which produce a kind of 
mosaic effect of all these manifestos. So it's not a single declaration. The, the genre is still there, but it's actually distributed, which has a kind of interesting um, multiplier effect. It also has a kind of potential pitfall in, in dilution. Mm -hmm. It's a very, it's an interesting kind of... But that, that, that was also part of Paris, Paris in 68. Too. Mm. I mean, Paris in 68 was not just a few declarations by the Beaux-Arts right. or the students of the Beaux-Arts and multiple yeah. different ones. It was yeah. also declarations by the unions, by different unions, mm -hmm. and by politics from the far left to the, to the right. Absolutely. So there's a sense of, of that multiplicity in every one of those kind of semi-collective movements that gains strength from, yes. the, from, from the, ma the mass of the movement. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. To very brief, oh, just to very briefly answer your question, which I think is a very good one. I, I um, uh, just would stress that you know, one of the things I was trying to um, um, point to was the degree to which the, um, these manifestos really articulated with some precision something about the uh, contemporary condition, whether it be you know, technological, political, social, ecological. And I think that, let's say, you know, that would be... Um, one, um, I mean, it's not so much to say um, that's sort of why they should be written, but I certainly think, you know, when they are written, that these should be some of the qualities that they're not just, um, you know, what <laughs> Enrique was pointing to in, like, just stuff, but that they, um, you know, a a articulate a type of intervention that is a, a knowing one, knowing both in regard to the history of architectural, you know, discourse and manifestos, but also uh, with a specificity about the, the current um, situation. So I guess that, I mean, doesn't totally answer your question, but certainly I think that would be what's at stake for me in, in the form. My take would be that basically uh, there are conditions are uh, quite unacceptable for people to take position and, um, and also within the field. Uh, what I think is that basically the revival of the term uh, manifesto in a very light way over the past few years uh, has also produced a number of kind of extremely domesticated pieces of writing. I mean, two Biennales ago, Venice Biennale, uh, not the last one, but the one before, there was a deliberate, uh, let's say, manifesto where these were declaration, let's say, a mixture between a declaration of identity or these are a few of my favorite things. Um, <laughs> and so um, with basically no, uh, no critical approach to problems within the field or to um, actually with a, a general lack of arguments uh, in, in general terms. I, th I think basically, so I would be more skeptical of something that's uh, uh, presented under the term manifesto today than about somebody adopting very radically a position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, existing conditions. And one of the problems, I think, given the, the media structure today, which is absolutely saturated with opinion mm -hmm. and demagogic opinion, often filtered through mm -hmm. dem, you know, outright lies, which are then believed because it's the force of the opinion. It's very difficult to see how something as short as a manifesto mm -hmm. can actually. Right. But on the other hand, it seems to me to be essential to go beyond the, the slogan, right, mm -hmm. uh, and the treatise. Mm -hmm. And somewhere between the slogan and the treatise, um, we have to have a way of telling, of in, a, in a sense, truth telling, which is, which is, uh, which can be clarified, can be verified, and can be seen as not sloganeering, opinioneering, or you know, demagogic. Uh, and also which matters uh, more people than the one who writes. Yes. I think basically the collective impact of manifesto is, uh, is crucial, or any positioning, that basically the, the manifesto is presented through a crisis, and the crisis has to be understood by the reader to start with, so that the way out, which is presented as inevitable, is also uh, articulated in a clear way. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think based also that uh, the adopting position also goes hand in hand with the, the fact that that position is relevant to others. For example, the, the, the brevity of, of the term and the follow-up to Spaceship Earth was a lot more effective than McHale's ecological context, which mm. actually has more density and depth and mm. predictive qualities within it. Right. So it's, a, it's somewhere between those four. Right. Mm. in the notion of a manifesto, right? The very term manifesto at, that uh, Villa points out is that to manifest something, and what is it that we manifest? Uh, Derrida refers to uh, Marx's uh, critique of, or uh, rather appropriation of uh, uh, Marx's book, uh, Communist Manifesto, as a messianicity without messianism. So there's a prophetic component in, messia in manifesto, so to speak. 
but not without a lot of theological connotations to it. So for, for me, I find Kola's notions about retroactive manifesto extremely problematic in the sense that it is the kind of resurrection of the past into the present, which may be passed from lessons from learned from the present, we may have to project into the future. But the futurity of the possible future is completely suspended and eclipsed to the point where it becomes totally opaque, where the, because of the opacity, everything is traversed and disseminated into the cross time in the present moment. So it is a reactive manifesto that comes to an end in the present, devoid of the future. At least in Heidegger, you have the notion of the not yet. So the manifesto is implicated in the structure of the not yet, but not in the, uh, what Badia would call the human rights, whereby one is looking towards death, but one is looking towards the infinite future. And so I would say that there are philosophical, metaphysical, ontological commitment to the concept of the manifesto. Both historically, it is grounded in the notion of linear concept of time and history, right? So that uh, any kind of reflexive consciousness that appropriate past, whatever that may be in the case, and reappropriate and reflect it and reappropriate and reinterpret as a kind of a political, ethical, epistemological content for the future is relevant, but at the same time, I think what we need is a proactive manifesto so that the present is structured at the precisely situated at the intersection of possible past and possible future. So I think the, uh, it seems to me the, uh, the function and ontological commitment of manifesto is more towards the future rather than an infinite resurrection and reappropriation of the past into the present with the word of, of the future. Uh, my email address is <laughs> vidler at <laughs> cooperunion.edu <laughs> and you can write me one. About? A proactive manifesto. A proactive, yes, I, want, yes, I, want uh, from, I want it from I you. I think the present but, is but, strangely uh, Carl, void of deficient of the proactive proactivity. But the retroactive manifesto is basically a manifesto which is uh, written backwards. It's basically like Citizen Kane in film. Hmm. That's what hmm. a retroactive manifesto is. It is the, re the manifesto in, retro in Deleuze, New York, is basically um, a generation of architects that believe that form follows function. No, let, let me finish. Let yes. me finish. And, uh, and basically the assumption that uh, today as seen in an invention that was produced by New York, but that I can actually simply voice out, there's a complete uh, disjunction, to use Bernard's uh, uh, term, that basically was addressing similar issues, between uh, uh, an inside and an outside. There's no continuity between the former and the latter because of a number of conditions. Uh, elevator, air conditioning, uh, um, and so on. Well, so, so basically it's, uh, it's this, uh, and that has an effect on the work to come. Let's say Seattle uh, uh, Library is, an, is basically a byproduct of that argument. So, so the way in which the story is told is different, but in the, way, in the same way that but basically- it's a reflexive story. It's a story of the past that is relevant to the present, but not about the future. The future's unknown possibilities. But the other aspect that I'd like to mention from a philosophical standpoint is the generic imperative implicit within the concept of the uh, manifesto, and which is also tied to the, uh, you know, the Western concept of history. Why is it the case that the Eastern civilizations don't have manifestos? But there are specific theological, metaphysical <laughs> reasons for not having this type of a mm. genre. And so I think you cannot just leave down all these specificity and particularities you know, of, of making reference to kind of a you know, didactic discoveries, disciplinary references, and while at the same time bypasses and sort of, you know, completely, uh, how should I say, uh, not address larger philosophical, ontological, theological dimensions of what manifesto is. First of all, what is to manifest? Because only in the context of the Judeo Christian tradition, the in the beginning there was the word of God, right? The word of God is an infinite potentiality that is embedded in it, and that we must, and, that's, and this is the ethical in Paris, that what the manifesto is, what, could have, what was in the past, what could have been, what should have been, what ought to be the case. So manifesto is motivated ethically by what ought to be the case, and that that ought to be the case in the future is the word of God that is transpired at the end of time, and that we must live up to it so that the future possibility is brought back to the present, and but, not from the past into the present. But that's precisely my point. And the other thing, of course, which I will not get into, the metrics of ontology of time, is that the of conceptual time. So that do we still have, I don't want to go forever, but a concept of manifesto in it. <laughs> do we still have to, time? To, yeah. to, within the context of the lab. How about we could just let uh, the panel respond? And, uh, no, it's just yeah. that I, I feel that that you're absolutely correct in terms of your understanding of the position of the manifesto in relationship to Western culture. It's based on enlightenment Hegelian vision of uh, a dialectical progression of history. And Marx is right in there, rewriting mm -hmm. Hegel and uh, developing the dialectic. And all manifestos of the, of the genre that we've been discussing have that sense of historic uh, either retrospection or prospection built within them. What I think is the question, and you, you know, you 
start to talk about the way in which uh, Derrida unpacks Marx and the way of Badger unpacks uh, Derrida, but it, it seems to me that that critique, in fact, destabilized completely the notion of temporality, which uh, a manifesto has been, uh, has been constructed on the, the kind of manifesto you're talking about. So what I would ask is, are we in a, in a position uh, to still remain within the sort of Hegelian progressive ontology, as you put it, um, in, in producing our quote unquote manifestos? I think that's a really provocative question. Yeah. <laughs> Go. Just keep going. Okay. So, to thank everybody, especially <laughs> Craig. So, it'll just take a couple of minutes to get the uh, Jeffrey lined up.